Not be syringes this whole time. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right, how about now? Yeah, so Zoom had had decided that it wanted to automatically adjust my microphone volume. Um, which meant that it was set to super low. So anyway, <laughs> yeah, and it'll be extra fun because the uh, the stream picks up my microphone directly and not via Zoom. So so they'll 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 have heard everything. Uh, Rob is also a bit quiet, uh, by the way, but. As I was saying, welcome everyone. Uh, my voice is still, my throat is still a bit sore, so I will try not to speak too loudly. Um, and yeah, one reminder before we get started, if you're not actively talking, please make sure to mute yourself because otherwise we're gonna have a lot of background ambience going on all the time because people are gonna be clicking away at the keyboard and they're gonna be drinking or they're gonna be shuffling around some papers or whatever um which is like it's fine if one person is doing it but once it's like seven people doing it it gets a bit it gets a bit much um and second uh what about we start with taking a round of introductions does that sound okay or does anyone have other Hmm, <clears throat> any other suggestions? Seems like it's okay. So should we go by the top of the participants list and down? Which is more or less in alphabetical order. Alright, no objections. So let's do Rob first because he's the host, so he's at the top. And Rob is muted, yeah. Absolutely. Akshat? Hello, Star. Um, yeah, uh, Alistair, Akshad, Bob.
Catcliffe. Right, and I, I think it's it's Fresso now, which would be me. Hello, hi, I'm Fresso. Um, I have been a Music Brains contributor since 2006 or so, uh, and I think I'm not sure how long. I've, a long time, anyway. And I've been community manager for MetaBrains since about the last five years old. Uh, and I've kind of dipped my feet into pretty much more almost all parts of, of the MetaBrains wars throughout the years. Um, and yeah, and, and I'll be hosting you this weekend. Uh, I will do that, Catcliff. Um, Catcliff just asked me to, to, to mute them if they forget. Uh, and onwards to Kartik. You're, um, you're very quiet, Kartik. Try and try and look in your Zoom audio settings and see if it's also auto adjusting the volume for you and putting you way low. That was much better. So, Michael? And monkey. Uh, Rio?
newly appointed Secretary of the Board of Metabranks. Uh, yeah, just uh, just say. Uh, Sox. Thank you for being here and for contributing. Uh, Ivan? Uh, young all right young says they're in the dormitory so they prefer text chat they're young or we can call them York they started as a GSOC student this year mainly working on music brains and also doing editing work thank you thank you York and finally I think of the ones that are currently here Sass And we have Shivam just arrived. All right, I think that is uh, Lucien, oh, and Lucifer. We had Lucifer already, didn't we? Anyway, Lucien definitely arrived. All right. Uh, Lucifer, uh, Lucifer already did theirs, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You just you just change your name in the in the meantime. Yeah, just I got confused. <laughs> All right, so I think that's uh, instructions from from everyone. Um, actually, Rob, would you mind taking over because my throat is a bit. So I prefer to talk as little as possible.
do anything else that doesn't require loading all the tracks, then we save all the loading, which is really nice. So I'm really happy about this and thank Michael for that. And yeah, we have also improved the relationship grouping, which means that the relationships that are connected to each other will now much more show together and take less space and stop showing unrelated relationships in the release pages. So for example, Gangnam Style doesn't have like three screens worth of mashups and remixes anymore when you load the release. So what else has changed? So one less nice thing that you might, I expect all of you know, but just in case was that we discovered the leak of emails and birthdays back in late 2020, a bit after the previous summit. So that was fun. Uh, well, all of us, mostly Michael, managed to fix the, the whole issue pretty fast as soon as we discovered it. But of course, it was there for a reasonable amount of time, and we have no idea how many emails were compromised. We know some people got spammed because of it. So clearly, some people did get their emails compromised. So not nice. And uh, Recently, we did find two small situations more that you, if, unless you read the blog, you might not even have noticed about, which was, yeah, like, uh, CatCat found an issue where people could actually see tags that were supposed to be set as private as long as they went specifically to the right tag page, which we blocked as soon as uh, it was noticed. And uh, we hotfixed it uh, as well, just in case. I mean, tags are not like the most Crazy the private data in most cases. There are certainly not emails or like personal data, but it was still kind of disappointing to see we missed that before. And uh, Chavan reported, I think it was Chavan reported another situation where uh, you could actually visit the subscribers page for any private collection, even when logged out. Although, I mean, that's actually a really small leak in the sense that all you could see from there, if I remember correctly, was the title and the type of and the number of entities in there, but you couldn't even see the content at all. Anyway, that also got blocked as soon as we found it. And uh, as far as we know, there are no more situations like that. But as usual, please, if you see anything that seems like that seems like it should be private or it isn't, get in touch as soon as possible. Ideally, get in touch privately rather than adding a ticket, because then we can add the ticket once we have fixed it, so we don't tell everyone about it, so they can try to use it in the meantime. But like, if you have added a ticket, that's much better than nothing. And just like, thanks and sorry for the annoyances we've had. Now, what other big changes we've seen this year? Uh, one is uh, we've paginated the relationship pages, which have more than 250 relationships of the same type, which means that we finally can load the relationship pages for some entities like New York City or the London Symphony Orchestra which both of them, funnily enough, had 17,000 relationships. And when we are paginating, then we will just show 100 relationships of a given type to us a link to see all the rest. There are improvements that can be done here, especially for works, which only currently have one kind of relationship, but we still paginate them in a slightly weird way. But I think that, in general, this actually works really well. The only annoyance I've seen is, uh, personally, at least as an editor, is uh, that we don't have any great way to find a specific work by an artist, but we have actual filters coming in for that reasonably soon. So anyone who's been annoyed by that, like me, it's, it's on the works. Then we have a Young Summer of Code, which is a it had a really nice amount of uh, improvements, including the fact that you can now uh, finally mark relationships uh, to URLs as ended and add dates to them without having to go to the URL page and edit it from there, which hopefully will mean more people will mark things as ended instead of removing them when it's useful. Uh, it combines uh, all the different relationships for the same URL in one section, meaning that if you have like a band camp link with both uh, with all of the uh, streaming download uh, and possibly sometimes, although they shouldn't all be in the same release, often they are uh, also uh, 
purchase for, for mail order or via free download and purchase for download. Anyway, we have several times, two or three or even four times the same URL. Now they are nicely grouped. Instead of taking four URL lines, it's, uh, it also makes it easier to add the same, add another relationship to the same URL. Uh, just in beta, as of yesterday, is the last bit that uh, was worked on, which is edit highlighting for the URL editor, which means that similar to the relationship editor, now instead of just relations disappearing when you remove them and things like that, you can see a nice red, yellow, or blue, or, I mean, green highlight showing what's new and what has changed and whatnot, which I've already found pretty useful. And that uh, we finally are able to say that one URL can be auto-selected to several different relationships. So instead of just adding, for example, Bandcamp and being like, you decide what this is, and having people at Bandcamp as like official website, having people at Bandcamp as God knows what, as license sometimes, now it can be restricted to, it's only either download or stream. So you pick from those or pick both. So that's actually a really nice improvement in my opinion and should limit the amount of cleanup from like confused editors and newbie editors that we have to do. And uh, we have, we're still looking into more improvements. For example, I really want to make it possible so we can edit relationship credits for the URLs from there, because right now that still requires going to the URL page. But in general, I find that it makes things more, much more usable. There are some annoying bits. And I know that some people are annoyed by, and I am also annoyed sometimes by the URLs getting locked and being a bit harder to edit than they were before. But I do think that by now I'm seeing a lot more improvements than drawbacks there. And we can always try to iterate on any annoyances. So I think that's really great news. And I'm really glad also that the young is still con uh, contributing with us to this day. This didn't disappear after the summer of code and really appreciate it. So we finally started to officially link to like the big, big, big thumbnails for cover art archive images. We had been generating them for a while, but uh, we really needed to generate it for a lot of old images. And in another show of what our volunteers are happy to do, we actually got a lot of help from DraftDB to actually contact the Internet Archive, find the right people, ask them to specifically run the right uh, scripts and whatnot to the point where everything got indexed and we could finally officially link, knowing that every image will have the thumbnail. So those got actually linked, I think, a few, a few starting like half a year ago. I, don't, I haven't checked stats for how much they are being used, but I think it's really cool. And uh, yeah, since we've always had the question of what about the event art archive? Well, it's finally on the works. Michael has started working on it. I am not quite sure what the state is now. So Michael, do you want to tell us what the state is now? Sure. So there's, I think, two or three places we have to modify to support event artwork. Um, we have to update the CAA indexer, which we actually have a new project for called the Artwork Indexer now, although it's not deployed yet. And that has event art support. And that's finished. I just need to write a Docker file for it and get it up and running. And the other two places are in the CAA redirect service, we need to add API endpoints for event art. And I believe we would post that on a separate domain instead of coverartarchive.org. It would be eventartarchive.org. And, um, and then finally, we have to update Music Brain Server, of course, to allow uploading the actual artwork. And that's still a work in progress. So that's about it. I saw Rob wants to say something. Quick question. <clears throat> oh, can you hear me? Yeah, okay, good. Um, <clears throat> my phone's on set up right now. I'll fix that in a minute. Um, questions about this. So if it's going to live on its own domain, I guess that needs to have its own logo. Is that, um, or is, is it more or less considered to be a sub project of the cover of archive? Have you guys considered that? 
I actually asked the Internet Archive about this, which they would, if they would prefer keeping everything under the same project and domain. And they said it seemed to make more sense for it to be separate. So that's why I, and I saw we already had the domain parked and everything. So that's the only reason I leaned toward doing it that way. Okay, um, I have no problems with that. Um, Monkey, uh, at some point, it would be really lovely if you could work with uh, perhaps myself and the Bruce Price team to come up with a logo for the event archive. Cool, thank you. So that's really nice. I think we're doing better on that front than I actually thought we were, so yay. And we got instrument images this year. So instrument pages are now illustrated by with pre illustrations by the Japanese artist Iron. Iron, I'm actually not sure how it's pronounced, but in any case, they make really nice illustrations that the, they offer for free online. And we actually mail them and ask them, like, yes, to make sure we didn't have a common situation again. We asked for extra permission. We got the extra permission. So we actually have a GitHub repo where we store the images specifically organized by the instrument they are on. They actually get ported to static brains. And then, uh, so basically, uh, CatQuest and I are slowly adding in instrument images during the usual instrument improvement work. So you might have seen some already, more are coming. We don't have illustrations for literally every instrument, but we have illustrations for a lot of them. So uh, another big thing that had been requested for, I think, as long as we have had a ticket tracker pretty much, is uh, the first release date for recordings. So we added an implementation of that. It's not as good, I guess, as some people would have wanted in the sense that it only calculates based on the release, the first release date of the first release that we have. So it doesn't actually allow any dates for standalone recordings, but that still covers the usage of most people. And it's much better to have that than nothing. So we can eventually always consider expanding it if we decide there's a need, but so far, we have this available both in the web and the API. It's being used by Picard. It's being used by Listen Brains. It's being displayed in Music Brains. And uh, so far, I haven't heard a lot of complaints about it. So I guess people are happy. Uh, of course, as, as with almost everything in Music Brains, that depends on the actual recordings being correct and having been merged with the originals and whatnot. So if you have problems, consider merging recordings. And like, let's just, the better the data is, the better this will be. And we also had some other smaller schema changes. Can I just uh, throw in a quick comment as well? So we improved the performance of artist pages to the point where several pages were also timing out, no longer timeout. I think we don't have any timeouts anymore on artist can I, can pages. Can I make a quick comment? Yes. Also regarding the recording merges, I think that Alastair will have something to say about that during the listen brains thing. So, so anybody who is like watching this, uh, stick around for the for the state of acoustic brains as, as well. So we also added artist series, which already have gotten some use. I've seen them used for awards. I've seen them used for alumni of specific universities, which we have a relationship for, but that's specifically for music studies. But for example, some people studied journalism and whatever, or whatever, we don't currently store that in any other way, but people are actually using artist series for that, which I think is cool. And uh, we are, we added collection merging, which is again, a very niche thing, but it's something I needed. And I hope I wasn't the only one who needed that because I had collections that I really wanted merged. And uh, we had the place ratings, which is also super niche, but it was literally the only thing that could be uh, reviewed in critique brains, but didn't have ratings in music brains. And since we are eventually considering joining reviews and ratings in critique brains, then it made a lot of sense to make sure that this is consistent for everything that can be reviewed, that they, they can also be rated. 
So other non-schema changes that were, in my opinion, reasonably notable, uh, we added pagination and DAP, up and down vote filtering for user tag pages. So you can finally see what where you voted for, this song is really great, or what where you voted for, this is a rock album, and where you voted against it, instead of having it all in the same list, which was very confusing. Uh, we added better admin tools, both for user moderation, which I think Fresno has been happy with, but uh, I hope he will talk about it later. And uh, for attribute editing, for example, we are now able to set something, some, an attribute as free text without having to use the database, a database connection. For timeline events for statistics, which means that now they are actually getting added because no one had the time or energy to go at them one by one via the database. We added uh, a lot of improvements to our OAuth service, mostly thanks to the audit we got last year. After that, I think we've had a couple improvements further that were noticed later. So like, uh, I think by now it's, if it's not the best, uh, the best around, it's up with that. So I'm really happy about that. We have worked on a cleaning up and uh, adding typing to more of our JavaScript and Perl code, which means that it's a bit harder to make stupid mistakes, which is always a good thing. We, in a throwback to classic music brains before NGS, we actually added small entity icons uh, to show the entity type of relationships, which is not a big change, but one that's pretty visible. So you might have seen around. Uh, thanks to the work of Salarock, we released the Italian translation onto the main site and not just beta last year. And uh, after that, yeah, like just tons of small bug fixes and improvements. We have a lot of small old tickets that have been sitting there for years and years and years, up to 10 years in some cases that have been fixed. Which isn't helping. As you can see in the tab, our user still managed to add more, to find more problems than we managed to fix. But still, it's a lot more balanced a graph than it used to be a few years ago, where basically it was a huge gaping maw of red. So I'm actually pretty happy with this graph, even though it's still a bit scary that we're working that hard and we're still in the red. But, you know, we're getting there. We even had a tiny blip of green back in March. <laughs> so uh, news about Docker, which replaced the old DM. So it uh, basically, we have nothing interesting to say, which is amazing. Uh, it means that it's getting updated every time we release music brains. People seem to be really happy with it. Uh, we have seen a, a fair amount of cases where if anything breaks before we have even noticed something broke, we have already a PR by someone who has fixed it because they needed to fix it so they could keep running their own server and they send the PR to us. And yeah, like we're seeing more and more developers use it for, for both music brains and to run their own self server. So we are really, really happy with this. And I, I think it's a huge improvement. I want to, I want to chime into that and uh, say, yes, that has been a really drastic change because now we have something that I can point customers to and say, hey, just install this thing. It's just a few clicks. You may not be you know, ready for Docker or whatever, but this is the, just the best way of doing it. And people have very few issues with it. And what an incredible uh, way of really getting it uh, working for us. So thank you for the continued efforts on this front. Especially Ivan, thank you. Yeah, I must say that I still consider Docker a complete uh, box of magic, and I still have managed to get this running. So it's really not that hard, and I really encourage people to give it a shot if they want to try. Uh, uh, the main uh, uh, complaint we have from uh, people running the music brands uh, Docker. It's about the, the search uh, component actually. It's not the uh, Docker itself, it's uh, the search indexer, which doesn't work uh, very well uh, uh, in mirror mode. But uh, we are going, Reo will continue about search. So yeah, search has been a bit more annoying this year. Like you might have noticed sometimes that there are problems with indexing as in 
you add an artist or a release or whatever, and then you search for it and it's just not there. That's because it, even though it, I mean, it's obviously when it does work, which is almost all the time, it works so much better than the previous set server did, but we have seen it uh, crash reasonably frequently, which means that there is uh, yeah, gaps in the indexes. So anything that happened while it was overloaded or crashed just needs to be uh, like load, like re, uh, rechecked and uh, re-indexed. If, if I remember correctly, we even have a situation where there was so much that needed to be re-indexed that uh, did we even have to do a full re-index at least once even? Yeah, he said yes. So yes, we have had to do that at least once. So this is something that we really are trying to improve. It has improved a bit since the summer, but we think that some bugs are, that, that are due to the dependencies being outdated because Sir is still running Python 2.7. So we are really hoping that uh, we are going to get rid of that as soon as it's in Python 3 or at least make it better. Right. So yeah, so we're actually working on, on that. So mostly with the help from Kartik, uh, we and originally Ivan and I tried to give a hand as well. We finally got the uh, the SQL Alchemy version updated that given SERP is very, very much depending on SQL Alchemy. That was one of the biggest changes we needed to do. That's not deployed yet, but as far as I understand, that's ready. So I think we want to like add better tests and make a, a bit more testing before we put it out. But uh, that's a really, really big step for this. And uh, yeah, like Kartik also promised to look into well, I hope he promised. He mentioned he would at least uh, look into uh, making the tests use real data because right now they use mocks. And we saw when we were trying the SQL alchemy conversion that that's actually a really bad idea because several times the code was broken, but the tests all passed. So we want to make it uh, so that it tries to actually index real data and make sure that it re returns the same results as we were expecting, which is kind of what we do for web service uh, API testing in the music brain server side. And uh, having that should make it much harder to break stuff without us noticing. So once that is done, uh, we will continue working on porting the code for the rest of SER to Python 3, which is something that I am planning to work on. I expect uh, I will need some help with that, but I don't think it will be a huge problem once we have, yeah, like test to figure out if something broke during the porting. So I'm really pretty sure that this is going to be done by the next summit. So that's the end of like the announcements and updates about general things. Now I collected a few stats that I thought were fun or interesting. So this is the last year in numbers. So first of all, Music Brains releases. We finally passed 3 million releases, which is a lot of releases. It's probably still less releases than Biscox has, but it's still a lot of releases. I think no one can complain about having over 3 million of them, of which 11.5% were added in the last year. So out of how many years 21 years of existence now something like that like over 10 percent of the releases were added in 2020 the end of 2020 up until now so that was actually super impressive when i saw it i really didn't expect that much and that i think that's a really good sign of the state of the community right now and it's also a really good sign that, yeah, we are, that basically means that we are getting almost a thousand releases per day on average. And uh, when we check the information about the edit, the edit notes for their ad release edits, we found that at least 47%, and I think I probably missed a few importers, so the reality is probably over 50%, have been added with some sort of importing tool, which are all made by the community, which really shows how important, you know, community helping communities for the success of music brains as an ecosystem, really. Like, I think without those importers, a lot less releases would be being added. So that's actually 
really amazing. And thanks to everyone who works on making it easier, be it writing importers, be it writing any other tools to make editing faster. Thanks for all the user scripts, dude, this is amazing. So Jamrod, that was actually the thing I was very surprised to see. So I keep saying that, well, our general coverage is probably kind of shit. Like, you know, it's not great. We just added it and whatever. Well, I really underestimated how many general attacks we already had, I think. Uh, because, well, we don't have stats for this. It's actually a task for me for, for like the next month or so. I really want to start collecting stats better for general because we really didn't have them. But we literally have over 5 million single data points for Jamrod across all entities that are both upvotes and downvotes. So that's times a specific user has used a specific Jamrod tag on a specific entity. That's actually 68% of all tags in music, right? And that's accepted tags, meaning that, for example, if someone has written something in Italian or French, for example, it's not going to be there yet. If someone has rap instead of hip hop, it's not going to be there yet. There's plenty of these situations where aliases would probably raise that to, I would expect, at least 75% or something. But like, it's still like a really impressive number, in my opinion. So 12% of all artists in music frames have at least one genre. And that is something that is not really directly used for attacking. So it's actually a pretty impressive number just because of that. 33% of all release groups have at least one genre. So literally a third of all our release groups have genre tags, which is a much, much better coverage than I was expecting. Uh, Ivan, you wanted to say something. Yeah, about uh, junk for artists. Mm -hmm. We have a lot of artists which are just there for credits about photography or recording. So they don't have uh, junk by definition. Yeah, that's also true. Like uh, a lot, that's also probably why release groups are higher is because plenty of artists either don't put out any music, they just play guitar in some album, or they don't even play music in the first place. So yeah, they are photographers, they are engineers, they don't necessarily have a genre. So 12% is actually a really good number for this as well, I would say. It was actually a lot higher than I was expecting at least. So out of curiosity, I took a look about genre usage in release groups. So basically rock and electronics seem to be by far the most popular we have the next one is pop quite below the rest the next one is experimental which was a surprise for me because well that's not a genre to begin with but you know we kind of accept it but the, it, i was expecting it to be much lower than let's say jazz or hip-hop or metal and what one thing that was super interesting to me is to see that ambient is actually a lot higher than both metal and classical in genre tagging. I don't know if that means we have a lot more ambient than I thought, or ambient people really like tagging stuff with genres, but that is actually a really cool thing. And yeah, and well, as you can see, the long tail is really long. We have over 800 different genres now. So for example, let's say kawaii metal, or Finnish tango aren't particularly popular right now, but they are there, they are used. And that's really cool in my opinion, that if you really want to find a bunch of kawaii metal or Finnish tango thing, well, not a bunch for tango because there's only one, but if you want to find these things, you can. And I'm hoping this will only grow. Any Finnish tango fans in the audience, please go tag your release groups. So now some numbers about editors. We have more or less the same numbers as last year. There is a slight increase. It's actually it seems to be pretty stable at around 1,500 active editors per week and around 120 active voters per week. As usual, it's, there are a lot more editors than voters, which is not in itself a problem, but we can always use more people voting. So people go vote on stuff, make sure you subscribe to things, make sure you vote at least on things you really care about. And the uh, edit stats, we got almost over 9 million edits last year, of which 39% were edited, entered by the top 25 editors for the year, 
which seems like a lot, but it's actually less than I thought it would be. So 35%. With one yes. real quick stat, um, I just ran a query. <clears throat> and um, so previous years, so 2019, 2018, we had about 20,000 active editors in a given year. And for 2020, we actually had uh, 23,000 and a half. So we're definitely up about 3,000 active editors in 2020. Back to you. So 39% uh, of all edits were entered by the top 25 editors, which seems like a crazy amount, but actually it's not. I think if you looked at, for example, the English Wikipedia, you would see probably pretty similar numbers. Maybe not 25, but let's say top 200 or whatever, since they have more users. So that's not actually surprising. What I really like seeing is that 35% of edits were entered by editors outside the top 100, and pretty much half of the edits were entered by editors outside the top 50. Which means that you know, if a Discog spy operation kidnapped and killed our best 25 editors, we would actually be fine. I mean, not we, because I'm one of those 25. But you know, in general, the system would actually continue working. Discogs, please don't kill us. Uh, an interesting difference that I saw is for ad release edits, as you would expect, those are actually much more beginner friendly than average. Uh, only 21% of those were entered by the top edit, 25 editors, and 61% were entered by people outside the top 100. So basically, this really shows how there's a lot of small users so to say, and beginner users and like casual users adding releases. Well, there's a lot of experienced editors mostly improving data on those releases. I which have is a question. Not surprising in the sense that it's probably the same thing you would see somewhere like Wikipedia, but I think it's a really good sign as well of a healthy community where the experts, so to say, mostly work on improving the situation of things that the beginners and like the casuals or whatever you want to say it enter and how you, we couldn't really survive without all these release ads. Only the 20 of 25 would not have a healthy music brains community. So. I, have a, I have a question. Um, when you say top 25 and top 100, is that for the last year or all time? Yes, or? last year, all right. specifically for the last year. And uh, for example, a more technical edit, such as ad relationship, you can see that it's above average for the top 25 and under average for the people outside of the top 100. So I think this shows two things. One is that, well, obviously there's a lot of people who are interested in editing like for their tagging and they just need the track list so they don't actually look at relationships. Another is probably that like a lot of people probably oh, at the start don't even know that relationship set of thing. So like, I think it's always something we can work to improve how to introduce newer editors to relationship adding, but we also have to assume that a lot of them just won't need them. So I think those numbers are still pretty good. 30% outside the top 100 is honestly also better than I was expecting for relationship. Out of curiosity, run a query for works which is another thing I consider a pretty like high level editing kind of thing. And it's all very similar numbers. So it was also, I didn't save it, I think, but it was also 40 something to 30, which is also a lot better than I was expecting. I was actually afraid it would be like 15% only by like non-top editors. And uh, I think that's all I have right now. But if anyone has questions about how things are going or whatever, feel free. If not, I think, I've spoken for long enough, and I can always let someone else say something. Good job. Thank you for that uh, very excellent rundown. And uh, please make the um, notes available to me. I think this would actually be something very good to send to the board of directors and have, a, have them see where things are going. Um, gives a little more details than some of the things that I went down on. All right. Does that conclude all of uh, our chat with regards to music brains? Rio, are you done? Is the music brains team done? 
Uh, I am done. I don't know if the Music Brains team wants to add anything. Music oh. Brains will never be done. <laughs> of course, it will never be done. Um, well, unless uh, Michael or Yvonne have anything to contribute, it's time to move on. Right. Um, so, Lucifer is great to give us a little bit of a rundown on critique brains. Lucifer? Hi. Hello. Am I audible? So, I checked the statistics just before the last hour. So, we have almost 300 reviews since last year in critic brains. Uh, not much, but definitely much better than it was since last year. Uh, this year, we also started showing um, critic brains uh, reviews and ratings uh, in music brains. Uh, Rio did most of that work. We are also planning to add a feature to listen brains to write mini reviews for the users so that users can write mini reviews for their listens. Uh, it's currently a work in progress. Uh, Jason, uh, the uh, GSOC student, was working on that. Uh, it's uh, it's half done and still needs more work. Jason has not been around for the last month. Let's see if it comes or otherwise I'll pick it up. Other than that, has not seen much usage. We hope that adding the mini reviews feature will increase traffic for critique things. Not much to add on it. Uh, uh, also, uh, we added uh, some bug fixes and a couple of new features like Earlier, some entities, uh, entities could not be reviewed or rated. Now, mostly all entities can be reviewed and rated. So that's it for me. Any questions? Thank you for the update. Much appreciated. I, I think it's... Uh... Oh, sorry. <laughs> Never mind. Okay. Um, let's move on to the next topic. So that is uh, book brains. But before we launch into that, it is near lunchtime here in Spain, and I'm wondering when we should schedule our first break. Should we do that after book brains? Yeah, monkey thoughts on that? Uh, that works for me. Uh, in which case, you'll have to give me two minutes to uh, call the pizzeria, and then I'll be right back. Okay. Two minute break, and then because um, I you know, very inconveniently tasked Monkey to go uh, organize our food, and then immediately had him go up next. So uh, not best timing on my part. So two three minute bathroom break, and we'll come right back to this in just a sec, please. on the screen. So typical monkeying about coming up very soon. Here we go. Does everyone see that? 
All right, so uh, book brains this year uh, was uh, was definitely slower than 2020. Uh, the decision was made uh, pretty early on in the pandemic that uh, I would be spending a lot more of my time on listen brains, uh, which had more prospects of uh, floating us uh, financially uh, in the short term than uh, than book brains. Uh, it's not. Uh, it's it's been uh, it's been really useful actually for for on the distant brain side. Uh, uh, there's there's been really lots of improvements uh, on the on the book brain side. We've basically had uh, one big main feature this year, which was uh, uh, Akash's uh, uh, GSOC project uh, to add uh, one more main entity uh, to book brains. Previously, we didn't have a way to represent series, and obviously that was. Uh, dearly missing, missing for, uh, for books. Uh, and so that was a, a really uh, awesome project this year. Uh, it was surprising that we'd have uh, such a crucial project uh, this year in particular, because the, the scope uh, and the time of the projects have been diminished uh, or sh shortened uh, for Summer of Code. Uh, but uh, but Akash did a, did a really good job. Started started early and uh, and got in enough time to uh, to finish everything uh, and add uh, uh, other uh, required feature uh, on the way on the way to that goal, uh, which was adding uh, relationships uh, attributes, uh, which is going to be really handy in the future. Uh, so really. Yeah, really good. Good job to him. That was uh, that was uh, that was really awesome. And uh, check out the uh, check out the blog if you're wondering what's uh, what's what it's all about. Um, so I stole this slide from uh, last year's presentation. Uh, these were the uh, the goals uh, for for the coming year. Uh, as you see, uh, add the missing series entity is uh, is strike through. Uh, which uh, actually makes my job really easy for next year because uh, there you go. Here are the goals for uh, for the coming year. Um, I've been uh, I've been uh, also testing and improving the API, so that's uh, uh, really on the verge. And same thing with the author credits. I uh, I, I stopped uh, that close to having it uh, ready ready for beta. Uh, the now that uh, the bitmap has been doing lots of work for the for the event art archive, uh, I'm hoping that sometime in the near future uh, I'll be able to aim to have uh, uh, book brains covers as well. Album uh, album covers, uh, book covers. Uh, that would be that would be an awesome feature. Um, and then I have uh, I have some numbers for you. Um, Last year, there's uh, the uh, the Bookhogs community, uh, the Bookhogs website closed, and we uh, we had the, the the pleasure of having uh, a certain number of their very active users join join Bookbrains as a as a replacement. So this is that that spike that you see in in summer 2020. Uh, we haven't had uh, that same this year, but uh, the the number of new users is still on average uh, higher than than previous years, uh, except this. Uh, Giant spike for uh, for Google Code in in 2018. Uh, so I think overall the community is still uh, increasing at a at a good rate. Uh, similar uh, similar stats as last year uh, when I presented between uh, between summer of last year and and, and, and the summit in October. Uh, there were already five of the five of the top ten editors uh, had, had joined a few months previous, uh, so that's been continuing. And uh, as you can see, we've got uh, uh, a few uh, very active users that joined last year and have been doing a really good job at uh, at filling the database, um, which you can see in action here. Uh, the the number of uh, of, of edits. Uh, per month, uh, as you can see in the, the late 2020, there was a, a huge, a huge amount of work uh, that was done. Uh, some of these spikes or uh, concerted efforts uh, from the community to fix uh, to fix certain uh, certain issues in the database. 
uh, but generally, as you see, uh, compared to previous years, there's, uh, there's, there's a lot more happening on the website, uh, despite it being uh, not an off year, but uh, uh, in terms of development, at least uh, a, a quieter year. So the community has been really active. Uh, here's, uh, uh, again, the, those stats from, uh, <clears throat> from last year, April and October. There was already uh, a huge, uh, huge uptake in, in, in number of entities. Uh, and here we are a year later where uh, we have uh, three times the amount of works, uh, was it twice, uh, a little bit more than twice the number of authors, um, et cetera. There's, uh, it's really nice to see that, uh, that uh, having this, uh, this uh, new, more active uh, co community uh, coming together is, uh, is really working out. Uh, and here's uh, per, Here's the, the, the actual breakdown of, uh, of the new entities created uh, each month, um, which as you'd expect would have um, uh, a lot of authors and a lot of works as, uh, as the base of, uh, of, uh, of the uh, editions that are, that are added. Uh, not a lot of publishers, which is also expected. And as you can see, series is there, but uh, the uh, feature is uh, just finishing the beta phase, so it's, it really doesn't uh, doesn't appear on there at all. Uh, so as you can see, there's been uh, there's been a, again a huge spike uh, at the end of last year, uh, but overall the uh, the the community is still uh, adding uh, qu quite a few more uh, new entities each month compared to previous years. Uh, and as we, yeah, the yearly average is <clears throat> 20 times more than, uh, than, uh, than pre-2020 uh, levels. And that's of new entities. Uh, we've seen uh, a lot of uh, mergers. That's one of the big cleanups uh, that, that happened. Um, the, uh, the number of deletions, uh, deleted entities just uh, went, uh, went uh, down quite a bit. There's a, there's a couple of spikes here. Um, where a couple of users uh, took it upon themselves to delete a lot of stuff. Um, and, uh, and here's the, the main cleanup time, <laughs> uh, big community effort to, uh, to merge all the duplicates we could find. Um, and as you can see, after that, we, we really struggled to find, uh, to find duplicates in the database. And that's a, a cleanup that, was, uh, that had been necessary for, for uh, years. Um, so, uh, really good achievement uh, in terms of, uh, let's say the database is quite small, but now at least it's relatively clean. Um, <clears throat> and so you can see the, the correlation, there's, uh, there's uh, a lot of mergers and then basically no more, no more deletions. Uh, which, uh, considering last year was the introduction of the merging tool, has been like a, a confirmation that it's uh, successfully working. Um, in terms of code, as I said, uh, a lot less code than uh, than than last year, uh, but still more than than the previous years. So there's been lots of uh, small improvements and uh, consolidating of the of the front end. Um, and uh, less work uh, going towards uh, bigger uh, construction work uh, and new features. And uh, and that's it for me. I don't have a, I don't have a lot of uh, stuff to talk about, uh, but uh, I'm really looking forward to the coming year. Uh, hoping to spend uh, more time again working on book brains. And uh, and actually implementing those uh, those new features that are just about there. Thank you for an excellent presentation. And, uh, thank you for putting together slides. <clears throat> uh, thanks for making the rest of us look like total slackers. Um, maybe next year we should all plan to have slides. Um, I know the Lucid Brains team doesn't have any slides because uh, somebody is out and been slacking with other things. But um, so one of the things that um, that's always on my mind is trying to find, um, you know, given that we have some money and um, wondering how we can actually get uh, more coverage for book brains. Right now, one of my feelings is that we've got a very good uh, balanced team that's doing a lot of really good stuff. Um, 
I don't really want to add more, many more people to it because that's going to get really too many people stepping on each other's toes and actually diminishing a bit of our effectiveness. So I'm very hesitant about that. But Monkey, I guess, and, and the thing is like your role in, in the last year has been really incredible for like, getting grants prior and listen grants going. But I hate to see that the, the numbers for, for contributions and book grades are kind of tapering off. So maybe the thing that I ought to be thinking about is uh, finding a JavaScript developer that is actually going to be working for you so that you're you know, a little bit more on the management side, book brains concerns, but uh, still act actively jumping in and helping out with the uh, brains player development, which is obviously going to be an ongoing task and you're really critical for, for doing that. Um, I think that might work because that's not one person so much in the middle of everything, but a person that is uh, a little bit more off on the book plane side to make sure that uh, things keep going. And I get the feeling we can always use a little bit more JavaScript help, um, even in, in music brains and in many of the other projects. So if people have ideas about that, and, you know, um, ping me later, but this is kind of where I'm thinking about it. Like I said, I'm not feeling uh, in any sort of rush to go out hiring anybody, but uh, I like to have a plan and uh, in the back of our thought, like if some amazing hacker is just sitting there thinking that they wish to be part of the better brands team, they could make a good fit and we should just act on that. Um, as long as we can maintain our sort of family feeling that we're not uh, getting too big and losing the family feeling, uh, we can ensure that we can do that and I'm happy to respond to you. Do we have any other questions for Monkey? I kind of want to know where you hide your everything else, but I guess that's private. Anyway, your so, desk. Oh, ew, they're all rotten. Ew. Um, so seriously, uh, let's take at least a half hour break, possibly longer. It depends on how long it takes. Go to the bathroom, go get some food, and then uh, we'll rejoin in about maybe a little bit more than half an hour from now. So Central European time, that would be 3 p.m., 3-ish, adjust for your time zone. I'll keep the meeting going. So if people want to chat and be social, please do that. And uh, we'll see you guys soon. Bye. And I will set the stream to break. So thank you for watching. We will, as, as Rob said, we will be back in around half an hour-ish. So stick around or come back for then and go and stretch your legs and yeah
please. And this is going to be acoustic brains. So we are live on YouTube again, so hello YouTube viewers. Um, yeah, we will be starting in just a minute or so with Alistair talking about acoustic brains. We're just getting the last well, I was told to back kick together. It off in a minute, in a minute's time, so well, there you go. I think I'll do exactly that. Share screen. Um, four. Let's see. This top one is going to. This top one. Share. Ah. Uh, I will be back in three seconds when I restart Zoom to get screen sharing permission. I wonder how much of the stuff left over from the last summit was still not done. I mean, there's a whiteboard filled with a bunch of documentation stuff we never did. That's that's from the last yeah. last summit. That's from like three summits ago or something like that. But in general, I think um, I mean there was a there was a phase of I don't know five or six summits where we talked about stuff and never really got anything done. Oh man, you're just you're 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 giving away all your slides. Oh. All right, is that better? <laughs> I, 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 I will, I will, in, in my defense, I'll say that I made these slides when I saw how amazing Rio's were. Um, <laughs> so I, 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 I had to at least, uh, at least, at least do something. Um, okay, so acoustic brains, uh, state of acoustic brains, um, there's lots of synergy in acoustic brains and well, things sort of radiate from sort of some central point and, and do something. Um, I'm not really sure, I'm not really sure how that works, um, but things go up and to the right. And that's exactly what we need in acoustic brains. So I'm really, really pleased to, uh, really, really pleased to say that things are going up and to the right. Um, there's much JavaScript, um, it's, it's such well, um, in fact, it's it's such JavaScript that it's turned into into TypeScript, um, which is which is really really good. Um, so let's be a little bit uh, serious about this. Um, think things are going up and to the right. So um, this this is kind of interesting. <laughs> Rob's not impressed. <laughs> no, no, he's impressed. He's impressed. All right. Um, quite quite interesting. Um, um, Zas pointed out. A few days ago, um, and said, "Hey, uh, the acoustic brains database is now 1.2 terabytes um, 
we should probably take a look at what its sort of future growth looks like because at some point um, we're going to have to um, at some point we're going to have to work out where to store all of the data in acoustic frames. Um, we're hitting 25, 26 million individual submissions um, on 6.8 million unique music brains IDs. Um, this is not not keeping um, not taking redirects into account. And I'll talk about that uh, in a moment. Um, so huge, no, huge number of, of bits of data. Uh, I think we probably still haven't used, um, we haven't used acoustic brains to our advantage a lot yet. Um, and I think that's, that's starting to change. Um, and so really good to see that we're sort of uh, starting to come up with a few ideas about what to do with that. Um, such as uh, Acoustic Similarity, which we launched uh, 1st of September, um, which is from uh, Summer Code Project two years ago, three years ago. Um, so we're sort of finally getting around to taking a look at the, at the things that we have uh, to finish. Uh, in acoustic brains. Um, I've been working on a lot of listen brain stuff uh, this year. Uh, so sort of not doing as much as we uh, as we expected, but um, now sort of, especially with Lucifer's help, thanks a lot, Lucifer, uh, really sort of trying to say, hey, we've got these things that we want to do, um, these these things that are that are almost finished in acoustic brains. Um, so let's uh, let's get them launched. Um, so we got some really neat stuff, such as similarity. Um, coming out of similarity, of course, we have a plugin now for Troy, where we can do uh, we can recommend uh, similar tracks based on acoustic similarity, which I think is uh, is really neat. Um, there's been you know one, once we once we announced this on Twitter, uh, there was some um, interest on the on the forums. You know, people saying, hey, I've got no idea what Python is, and I have no idea how to install Python in Windows, but this idea of acoustic similarity sounds so interesting that I'm going to try. Um, and they managed to install Python and, and get the similarity stuff and try working. So, so that's really cool. So, so it shows that uh, the stuff that we're working on now is, um, is stuff that people are, uh, people are interested in. Um, I ran across this uh, just a few days ago. Um, which is uh, like a, a self-hosted music server, um, but it comes with, you know, music brain support, listen brain support, uh, music discovery based on tags, acoustic similarity navigation of your music collection uh, based on data from acoustic brains. So I think, uh, you know, to, to talk about the, the the year of Linux on the desktop and the year of uh, Acoustic Brains really um, really coming into its own. I think that that amount of data that we have is is incredible, and we really need to do something with it. Um, and so, in the coming year, um, a lot of my time, hopefully, is going to now start going towards that. Um, so I think uh, I think we'll get some uh, we'll get some interesting stuff done in terms of specific. Um, other specific things that we've done this week, uh, this this year, sorry, um, of course, uh, Lucifer um, turned up and bashed out a huge stack of pull requests. Um, so so thank you very much for that. Um, some interesting uh, interesting pull requests uh, up and coming. Things like uh, migration to Python three. Um, so Acoustic Brains and Sir are the two remaining holdouts in the MetaBrains universe, uh, which are using Python 2 still. The biggest reason behind that is that uh, we have some machine learning features uh, that are Python 2 only. Um, however, uh, with Pantelis's work uh, last year uh, during Summer of Code, uh, we developed a new machine learning infrastructure, which again is a, is a pending uh, task in progress, but something that we're hoping to, uh, to get to. Um, and get finished in the next uh, in the next few months. This will allow us to, to upgrade to Python three, absolutely. Um, the other big 
uh, project that we have to work on is uh, integration of the Music Brains database. Um, so again, Lucifer did some did some great work uh, on this uh, earlier this year um, around the so so the the idea here is saying well we we know you know within a number of our projects we we need access to the Music Brains database uh, in Listen Brains we're doing this by having a, a separate uh, database uh, connection. So if we need to make a query to Music Brains, we make a query to Music Brains. Um, for Acoustic Brains, we have similar, we have a, this, the same requirement, but one thing we had sort of hoped to look at and, and we had hoped would be possible was to actually run both databases in the same database server, in, in, in the same database, uh, in separate schemas so that we could do a single SQL query that goes between the acoustic brains and the music brains data. This allows us to do interesting stuff, especially around uh, building data sets um, and sort of doing analysis on the acoustic brains data because it allows us to get all of the uh, all of the sort of related information in um, in a single query, uh, which we have an intuition is faster than doing it perhaps in um, in in a way in a more traditional way let's say where we have two database connections and we do one query we get a bunch of things we do another query we get another bunch of things and we join it together uh, in in the server um, so this is uh, still pending um, uh, Lucifer ran some interesting uh, experiments a few months ago uh, we got some stats which sort of seem to indicate that um, the amount of effort that we were going into to, to do this sort of replication into a separate schema in the acoustic range database, um, there was a lot of effort for not much benefit. Um, and so we tried a, a few other, uh, we tried a few other things, um, but that's sort of pending as well at the moment. Um, this ties into, into the, the comment that I had about the, um, about the, the statistics. Uh, where we do have uh, total unique MBIDs, uh, which is 6,855,000. Um, this doesn't take into consideration uh, music brands IDs recordings that have been merged. And so one, uh, one interesting thing that I, that I really want to do, and it, it, also ties into, um, it also ties into the similarity, is that um, many of the um many of the similar tracks that we get uh we get we get duplicates uh so so because acoustic brains allows duplicate submissions uh if someone submitted the same music brains idea if the same music brains idea has been submitted 10 times uh, what we're finding is that is that those duplicates appear uh in uh in the similarity but what we also find is that we get uh items so we, we try and deduplicate these but we still end up with duplicates because these are uh, distinct music brains IDs, distinct recording music brains IDs, which are um, which show up, which is great because they are they are uh, acoustically similar. But because we don't have that information, we don't have the, the redirect table in acoustic brains yet. We can't squish these together and say that they're the same thing. Uh, so yeah. Um, in, in summary, um, one big feature this year, uh, a few uh, more people developing. Um, right, uh, Catquist says that we need to show disambiguations from music brains, which, which is exactly why we sort of have this, this want to bring in the music brains database into acoustic brains. Um, because the moment that we can do that, we can say, hey, um, these are actually merged together. So let's just bring them together or in the case where they haven't been merged and there is disambiguation right we can show the disambiguation uh, the big feature that i want uh, for this is um, to be able to help people to build data sets so you could say give me uh, all of the recordings from artistic x or give me all of the recordings that are tagged in music brands with genre y uh, and then it can give you stats and it can say hey um, you know this data set that you've, that you've built is uh, a little bit um, offsided because you know you've got a you've got a category which only has recordings from one artist in it, or you've got categories you know that 
that aren't, um, aren't, aren't important enough uh, based on the statistics that we have in music brains. Um, so for me, that's a, that's a really big, interesting uh, feature that, that uh, I want to get added this year. Um, we've had people asking for quite some time um, about dumps, uh, which is certainly something that we've let uh, fall by the wayside. Um, I know Param was working on this in, in 2018, um, so we're, we're definitely uh, well, uh, well overdue for, for finishing that off. Um, so the big hope is, is that um, I will be putting a little, little bit more time into acoustic brains, uh, at least through to the end of this year, hopefully a little bit, little bit into next year, uh, to get some of these sort of almost there but not quite features uh, pushed through. Um, and in a way that allows people to actually start using uh, the acoustic brains data uh, in, in more detail um, as people are now starting to ask us for. That's me, thank you. Anyone have any questions on acoustic brains for Alistair? Okay. Uh, no, but I have, a, I have a comment. I'm really excited to see uh, Brain uh, integration into Picard. I think that's uh, that's super awesome. Um, yeah, uh, actually, that's going to help a lot because there are lots of pending um, open tickets about people complaining about my terrible command line uh, submitter for acoustic brains, and so we can just delete it and tell people to use Picard instead. Yes, uh, another problem with acoustic brains, you can't run it on uh, network, uh, external hard drive and things like that. Oh yeah, that's, that's been a, that, that, I mean, but that was a bug. I mean, because when, when we did the, the graphical interface, um, I basically just took the source code for the AcoustID submitter and ripped out everything that said AcoustID and replaced it with acoustic brains. Um, not knowing how to program C++, Qt, or anything. So yeah, lot, lots of lots of bugs which um, were again left behind because we didn't have experts in desktop C++ programming. Uh, and and I certainly think that uh, just just getting rid of those tools, which which appear to work. I mean, you look at the stats; people are submitting stuff. So so at least something something's there. Um, but uh, getting everything integrated into into Picard since that's the the main tool that music brains promotes anyway i think that's uh that's going to be a great a great feature right, now with acoustic brains i uh i we don't have any stats on what do we have stats on what clients are submitting acoustic brains no no all right because i know that beats has an integrated acoustic brain submission plug in as well and i don't know if any others out in the wild have it, i'm so. i'm aware of i'm aware of one more from a from a research collaborator uh, who, right. I have, who, who added it into his uh, his app as well yeah. mm -hmm. rob um is uh, producing a data dump of beats pm or bpm is that something that's on your roadmap um Nominally tied to doing dumps, yes, but as an individual, let's get it out quickly. Uh, not really. I, I know. I know you're right. We we had talked about that, um, and and maybe we should uh, we should take that up again. I think I think bundling in with the work with the dumps is a perfect time for that. Um, one of the reasons why I'm bringing that up is because I see that EPM is uh, probably one of the most reliable and useful elements of uh, acoustic brains right now. And last time we looked at uh, the traffic, there were a lot of BPM lookups. So putting out uh, dumps with BPM data is going to be a big deal in a lot of respects as far as the visibility that we have. And also it, it, it allows us to put the acoustic brains a little bit, you know, raise it up a little bit more and say like, look, there's direct real life things that you can be using and have be useful for you. Um, these things are always uh, important for me from a business perspective because um, when we first uh, started competing with Gracenode, uh, I looked at their offering, the things that they offered, and then anything they didn't have or we were losing customers to the Gracenode just because we were missing one elemental uh, aspect of our uh, portfolio stuff. 
the Cover Art Archive is a great example of that. That was created because we felt like we needed to address that as a lacking bit. And um, all of these things then you know, create these feedback loops, right? As soon as people see, it's like, oh, BPM is coming. Hey, how come I don't have BPM for this? Submit it through Acoustic Friends. Oh, that's why I need to submit things to Acoustic Friends. Okay, right? That loop. And the more loops, and this is sort of like an appeal to everyone, the more of these loops that we can create in all of our projects to, to you know, put out some data that people can get addicted to so they can then, you know, uh, put that particular feature in somewhere and then that draws more people in. Uh, a couple of years ago, I talked about the, the importance of us integrating the brains to take like this brain and that brain and, and do some counter, uh, some cross-pollinating uh, which is now starting to happen, you know, the, the Picard having blue sequence uh, um, stuff is, is exactly that. And um, so these kinds of feedback loops are hugely important because they increase the value for, for everything. That said, do we have any other questions for Alistair on acoustic friends? Okay, <clears throat> next one up is uh, community. Preso, are you ready to jump in? Hi. Um, just so community stuff. Uh, Rio presented a lot of the numbers, so I'm not gonna go over that. Um, I am gonna first make an apology to the community. Uh, I have been quite absent for most of the year it is for some personal health reasons um trying to pick back up again now and it seems like it's taking better than it did in my other attempts so yeah um one thing that kind of impacted the community a lot for a short period and then it soon returned to pretty much business as usual is the hostile takeover of freenode which meant that we've moved our presence off of Freenode ISC to Libera Chat. Uh, and besides, for like, there was a, a week or two where things were a bit chaotic and tumultuous. But after that, it's pretty much just been business as usual. And uh, I haven't heard anyone have any strong complaints about Libera Chat. Uh, so. I'm I'm glad we made that move and you made that move quickly. And I not to tout my own horn, but I feel like we did it fairly efficiently as well. Uh I know some other communities have like been in kind of a limbo for m a month, more than a month. Um in deciding on whether to move and where to move and so it was nice if we would just be like, yeah, free node is, is shit, let's move off and let's move off to this place uh, and just get it done. Um, yeah, how about we finish this meeting over in the new place? I think that was pretty good. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, so other than that, on the, on the more directly uh, Music Brains uh, side, side of things, I have had a lot of queries that have been like, hey, Rio, hey, Bitmap, can you look this up in the database for me uh, with with regards to users, since users are not in the replicated, so I don't have a, a local copy of that. And over time, I kind of made note of which are the queries that I keep asking them. And then I've made tickets to say, hey, can you, maybe we can make a tool directly in the code base for this. And I feel like a, a bunch of these tools have kind of come to fruition now. And it's really helpful to be able to, to look up a lot more things uh, with regards to being able to investigate uh, potential spammers, potential uh, ban evaders, um, and, and these things. And in some, uh, some cases, catch them before the community catches them. Uh, due to these tools, um, so that's that's really really neat, and I know that's 
there are a couple more tools pending. I know there's one uh, pull request from, from Rio that is currently pending uh, that will allow me to delete a bunch of accounts in one go. Uh, we have some cases where people have created like tens or hundreds of accounts to uh, give ratings on a given entity or put a given tag on a given entity. And it's a lot to wade through manually. Uh, so those have kind of been deferred for this tool, which should hopefully make it in before the end of the year. Uh, Rio is nodding. Uh, and another thing I've, I've requested uh, recently, I brought it up in one of the Monday meetings, is a flag, specific flag for spam accounts. Uh, because I've been kind of, I've been disabling spam accounts, uh, their ability to do anything meaningful on, on Music Brains. Uh, but obviously the accounts, the user page would still be there and would still be available for, for Google or for random users. And sometimes I've had an account I've disabled months ago and uh, some user comes, up, comes across the account and reports the account and it's like yeah that that account is already taken care of so i've made a quest and i'm not sure if rio already made a pull request not about it but there is uh, work already being done for a spammer flag that would allow me to mark an account as spam and disable access to the account so people won't come across it uh, but also will keep the account data in the database until we have spam brains sometime in the next 10 years, maybe. Uh, so we can just feed it a bunch of data right off the gate. And um, and yeah, uh, Rio? Yeah, I wanted to mention that, yeah, the spam flag is kind of in, like in the sense that we have the, the code in the PR for the basic stuff, but we need to probably, I mean, it just doesn't do all the things we wanted to do yet, but like I'm expecting that we'll merge that for sure before the end of the year so that the spammers can at least be tagged as spammers. Maybe in the meantime, we can just show in their profile, but actually I think it, it even hides their profile already, even possibly, I'm not sure. I don't remember right now, but anyway, like basically that shouldn't be very hard. Like other things like sending deletions or whatever to Discord, things like that are more complicated possibly, but the, we can certainly at least start that soon and then like make it do more things further down the line. Yeah, so that should hopefully decrease the like the the random spam accounts that uh, that people come across and, and report, uh, especially ones that have already been kind of blocked on on the back end. Um, yeah, uh, one other thing is that we've been a bit uh, seeing some uptick in spam on listen brains, uh, at least. I, I can't remember if we've had any on book brains yet, uh, but that's probably going to come eventually as well. Uh, so that's also, we've had some uh, issues with, with uh, navigating between the different users. We have a problematic user and listen brains. I want to be able to easily go back to music brains. That part is is easy. The well, that part is already implemented in the listen brains. Users have a link to music brains, but we don't currently have have easy access the other way around. Uh, I've made a kind of uh, I've made a user script for myself personally, uh, which I've been meaning to to share around, which helps me to look up users in book brains and listen brains and the forums but uh, that's definitely something that i hope we'll be able to get more done on uh, in the in the coming year so which will also help linking all the projects together and hopefully make it all feel like a more cohesive community instead of like this music brains one and the listen brains one and uh, hope, hopefully helping to, to bring all of that together a bit more as well. Um, 
I think that's about all I had to report. Oh! Um, one other thing I also wanted to mention. Okay, I think I probably touched on this last year, but uh, that was before the period would have started. So there was no Google code in uh, last winter, and Google code in is, uh, as far as I know, permanently discontinued, uh, which is a shame, but uh, it is what it is. Uh, Google Sum of Code at least is still going strong. Uh, so that's good to see and good to see new people coming in from Google Sum of Code. We have some in the, in the summit right now, uh, watching and listening. And yeah, uh, I hope, not going to promise it's going to be for next year, but I also hope I will be able to uh, look up, uh, look into getting involved with Outreachy before too long, which is probably like within the next one or two years. Um, so that's hopefully something to look forward to as well. We'll see. Oh, and one last thing is also uh, one big topic that's been over the last year, that's kind of been a recurrent theme in the forums is questions about handling uh, transgendered people in, in music brains, which is a, which is a big discussion. And I just want to say that I've been cracking really hard down on anything that even smells like transphobia or queerphobia of any kind. And, um, and I just want to really reiterate that message to anyone watching, uh, that Music brains and, and the meta brains community as a whole will not tolerate any kind of bigotries uh, towards LGBTQIA plus people or any other other kind of minorities. So we are hoping to met, to be able to find solutions to all of these uh, database problems with regarding how to properly record. Uh, gender and and things like that, name changes, so we don't um, dead name people who are in are in danger. And yeah, it's we're 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 looking into things how we can do things from a from where we can both protect LGBTQIA plus people, but also and also have a usable date, database uh, and and database structure uh, that is still meaningful. Uh, if you have any input on that, there are some discussions in the forums, but please read through them first, because there is likely a chance that your suggestion has already been uh, mentioned. Uh, but do read through and see if there's something not. And again, anything that even has a vague faint smell of uh, transphobia or other queerphobia is going to get uh, slammed down on real hard. Uh, so yeah, that's it for my community update. Fantastic, thank you. Um, also, again, thank you for, for persevering and uh, being present again. This uh, this was like one of the elements that was missing as of late. Like you know, we we were kind of missing one of our eighteen nineteen wheels. You know, as strange as that may sound, but like it was important to have have you back around. So I, it feels a lot more a lot more rounded, a lot more sane. And um, you know, I appreciate your efforts in missing breaks because uh, I feel like people are getting spanked down, which is exactly what we need to be have happening on that front. Do we have any more questions for Faisal? All right, now you have to endure me some more yammering. Um, and once again, I have no slides. I spent a bunch of time putting together a set of slides for a talk I'm giving on Tuesday as part of the, um, uh, the Open Data Initiative uh, Peer Learning Network. And I'll publish those slides once I've given that talk. Nothing earth shattering to any of you folks. Kat, Kat, did you have a question? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> 
So let's go into actually maybe do one quick thing because uh, somebody just decided to come into Signal and talk to me about something rather important. And uh, it's all set to messages that are about to disappear. So um, it's some very interesting stuff. So um, our board of directors is amazing. We have a lot of people that are that have a lot of uh, uh, eyes and ears in many different places, and they are actively listening for us and giving us contextual stuff. So um, very happy for that. <clears throat> All right, uh, let me come around and focus on listen rights. So this is the listen rights community update, and um, it, it, so much stuff has happened. It's 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 almost uh, it's head spinning because we've had uh, quite a bit of an effort. Uh, sort of this monkey kind of job talking like. When the pandemic kicked in, we decided to reshuffle things as a oh shit, do we need to actually have something generate more data, more more resources, more income for us? Um, this is actually the first time I thought about this. That hey, you know what? Um, we were not negatively impacted by the uh, pandemic in any significant matter. Maybe time to actually rethink these things. So uh, having some conversations with uh, Monkey and Alistair about that as well. <clears throat> that said. In the past year, we've done an incredible number of things. Uh, I'm going to start rattling some of these things off. Uh, we have implemented playlists. So now we have playlists that are, you know, they don't actually require you to have files, but they're just MBID playlists. And um, that may have seemed like a weird thing to introduce so quickly into listen variants, but um, one of the things that we wanted to actually provide um, recommendations to people, they need some place to go. And playlists was, the most obvious way, and we created this concept where a user can follow the Troy bot, and Troy will create playlists on behalf of another user. So those playlists are not actually owned by that user, but they're owned by the Troy bot. But if a user likes a playlist and likes to save it, all they need to do is uh, make a copy of it and they're good to go. Um, I don't anticipate playlists being used very much uh, anytime soon other than delivering uh, recommendations, but once we do that, people will be aware of the playlists. Uh, they come out and much more useful. <coughs> we talked about Troy as well. The Troy is uh, you know another uh, Star Trek Next Generation character. She's the empath, and uh, sort of I thought was very fitting for our music playlist recommendation project. Um, so the idea behind Troy is that it's a play. It's a toolkit that does not actually require any local data. Download Python. Download this, download a couple of libraries, but all of the data are on APIs. That's why we created uh, some of the Bono APIs, some of the data sets APIs, in addition to, of course, all the other APIs we already have, and it ties them all together. Now, we've been building so much stuff that we're now at a point where hopefully I will be sitting down in the next week or two, and of course, I've been saying this for at least 18 months now, um, that we'll be uh, ready to start cranking out some of these features. So. Just a couple of weeks ago, he said, like, what would it take for us to do Spotify's release radar? And Yvonne said, yeah, uh, craft this query to find out what was released in last week. And then we'll just jam that into Troy and actually make a playlist. And we'll just deliver that on Friday morning to people. And that's our release radar, right? Pretty trivial stuff. Um, we've been just doing a lot of stuff in the past few, in the past year, two years. And we're now at the point where we're just able to deliver, deliver these things at a very rapid pace. Sort of almost being, uh, I don't know, it's like putting this, this picture up. It's, it's like we're knocking out recommendations in a week. Well, that's not really true, right? We've been working on the statistics, which we got a uh, you know, year and a quarter ago. Um, Ishan did a really fantastic job. But then Lucifer had to spend, uh, Lucifer, Alistair, and I spent a huge amount of time getting dumps to work right and getting all of the um, the Spark cluster to, to, to be scaled up and to be working reliably. Lucifer did a really bang up job with that. Um, recommendations are working. They seem to be okay at the moment. Um, it, it's up to me to take Troy and actually start using these recommendations, start cranking things out. Um, it's, again, it's really good that all of these things are there. The Spark cluster is behaving very nicely now. Um, and, um, you know, we've done a number of speed improvements in being able to load listens, and uh, we had some problems where listens were not findable for some reason. So that was a blood, sweat, and tears project that's uh, done and working, still be improved, and uh, we'll have to jump back into that. Uh, Monkey, of course, has been doing an absolute bang-out job with Brains Player. In case you haven't uh, looked at that, 
it is stunning because now we can actually have a page where people start playing things. And uh, in particular, uh, Hue Sound. Um, if you haven't looked at Hue Sound, you can go to test.listenbrains.org to the Explorer menu, which is new, and uh, play around with Hue Sound. And it is the ultimate sort of color oriented uh, short attention span music discovery tool. Click on a color, see some colors, click on an album you like, and start getting music. It's just like rapid fire, right? This wouldn't have been possible without Brain Player. So, <clears throat> all the work that we put into Brains Player and making it work, and all the refactoring that Monty's doing right now is really coming into its own, and it's really producing some really fantastic things that are allowing us to deliver features that uh, even three years ago we were just dreaming about having. So that's really quite exciting. Thank you, Monkey. Um, <clears throat> we just also knocked out the love-hate page so you can see what tracks you've uh, loved and hated and then be able to edit them from there. And most importantly, play all your love tracks because you know sometimes you just want music that uh, you love, right? And just like, bang. Or if you're really feeling hate for yourself, you can play all your most hated tracks and see how that goes for you. Um, and this also flip side, should we, should we maybe for, for, for uh, uh, April Fool's Day, make a collaborative filter that says like, you hated these tracks and we made a playlist for you of, of other stuff that other people hated. Nah. <laughs> it's a bit far out there, but uh, it's probably too much work to do, but it's just that sort of stuff is like, I don't know, it tickles my funny bone. <laughs> um, I think that would be really funny. <laughs> yeah, if, if there's a way of cutting and pasting that and it's less than three hours of work, Lucifer, maybe you should think about that because it would be funny. <laughs> but if it's any more than three or four hours worth of work, it's probably not worth our time. Um, we also uh, built a pile of social features. So now Lisa Reigns has a user feed where you can follow what people have been playing. We have pinned recordings. We have recommended recordings. Uh, the, the, the critique pains uh, reviews, you know, we still have some work left to do on that, but that's going to be very interesting. Um, and, you know, the other social features also include similar users and the similar users, we had to go back for several times to go get some of that data massaging right. But uh, my closest partner, Kirsten, we have a very similar music taste. And uh, if she wasn't going to be anywhere near my top three, I would declare this to be wrong. And uh, for the past few weeks, she's been at number one, and I started listening to users number two and number three, and then she looked at me and said, like, hey, wait a minute, I'm not your number one anymore. <laughs> so now we're concertedly going and listening to each other's music streams to see if we can, like, get back to each other's number one, which is, you know, pathetically cute. But, uh, you know, that's uh, the sign, that that's the sign that this is working. So again, Lucifer, like, great job knocking that out and, you know, the perseverance to, to bear with me to get that to work because now it works and people are, are and they're using it and understanding it. And I love being able to go um, go to a similar user, click on their uh, their top tracks, which Monkey just made playable, top recordings, and just get a feel for who they are. That is such an incredible thing to be able to do. I absolutely love that. Uh, <clears throat> and something that I've been sort of like you know, complaining about having been in the data gulag, building the Listen Brains uh, mapping, and um, so the listen brains mapping is something that's it's a very invisible sort of thing in the grand scheme of things. Um, but uh, you know, some of you may or may not have accounts on the stats server. <clears throat> if you do, I mean, you can create yourself an account for free. Uh, in the chat, I just posted a link to that, and that is how we're keeping track of our uh, the mapping and some of the other Spotify bits and incoming listens and so forth. Some of the interesting bits I could share from there is that our number of uh, monthly users that are actually recording the Spotify listens was hovering around 1800 for quite some time, we're now at uh, 1930 users or so. So that's uh, increasing slowly, but it's increasing. And we can see that this one, the importer is, uh, uh, it is working and so forth. And uh, Kat Price, what was your question? Something about limited? Uh, ask a question in, in IRC and I'll answer, I'll answer it here. Um, the, I recently restarted the, the MBID mapping writer because it uh, needed to do a lot of, uh, I needed a bunch of changes to improve things. But if you look at this page, if you have it open in the bottom left-hand side, the bottom left-hand side, the MBID mapping writer stats, 
we are now, uh, this is just all of the new stuff that we've been uh, mapping in the last couple of weeks is what these stats apply to. 95% of the tracks that are incoming get a match of six. So that, that's incredible, right? That's, that's, that's taken a lot of effort to get there. And uh, what that does is it allows us to actually go and um, actually, I, why am I not sharing the screen to look at this? Hold on, that way you can see what's going on. Uh, uh, here. So this is the screen. I hope you guys can see the screen. Uh, and the top part is the incoming listens, and that shows us, uh, you know, when someone does an import, you can see the blue peak over here. Somebody did an import. Rob, you the top side that. is a message and signal. You probably don't want us to see it. The bottom side is IRC. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That one is. Uh, thank you. <laughs> oh, you can you can see that screen too. Oh, oops. Right. Um, we can see only that screen. We're actually, in terms of, we're actually not seeing any listen brains, anything right now. Uh, okay. How do I how do I get it on this screen? It offered oh, me a choice I earlier. See. I see. Okay. Now that looks more like. Okay. So here's the blue peak I was talking about. These are the incoming listens. Um, I don't know what these hourly peaks are. That's kind of weird. But this blue peak here shows that somebody is uh, importing uh, some listens, and it looks like somebody's doing that right now. Um, we're keeping track of how long the Spotify uh, importer takes to to import uh, data, and how many users we've got. So here we are at around uh, uh, 1,930 uh, listeners, and this also shows how many listens we're importing per minute. So 28 listens a minute, and so forth. Uh, down here at the bottom, we've got the MBID mapping writer stats. And uh, so we've got 8 million, um, 8 million unique uh, metadata combos that are mapped with different levels of uh, data accuracy, whether they're low quality, medium quality, and so forth. And down here at the bottom, this is what I was talking about a minute ago, we've got the MBID mapping writer stats since we restarted it with an astounding overall 95% match rate with an even more astounding 86% exact match rate. So if somebody gives us a match from, uh, from Spotify, chances are it's gonna be matched exactly. We don't have to do any fuzzy matching there, which is rather interesting and amazing. Um, and the, the date that shown is just where the um, leg legacy listen, uh, so the, the mapping is actually done, done in two parts where the, uh, mapping is doing things live and then once a day it fires up and goes back in time to see if there's any that have missed or have been changed and it goes back in time and um, maps those. Now, one of the things that, um, that there should be coming soon and um, hoping this month we will find some time for this is to, uh, to actually add the um, MBIDs to the listens, to the listen pages. So that's where we're providing MBIDs both uh, what the user submitted and then our mapped ones. And if we'll give preference to what the user submitted and um, anything that isn't user submitted will actually then show what we mapped. And uh, so we should see a lot more of the listens come alive with the uh, links because those are being sent out already. Um, they just need to be exposed in the UI. And um, I'm gonna go back to screen share for just one second and show you that we've been working on, sorry. Uh, so we've been, uh, let's start the right side here. Here we go. How many of you guys have looked at uh, uh, Q Sound? Q Sound has been so much fun. And uh, you know, I thought Zaz is just, you know, it walked into the living room, Zaz is uh, sitting there and we're listening to some rather shrill kind of crappy music. And uh, I look at Zaz and goes like, oh, don't look at me, man, Q Sound. <laughs> So we can pick a color. I'm just going to go pick, you know, a random color, bright green. And here comes cover art for the bright green. And some of these, like you look at it and go like, uh, how is this dog bright green? It's like, well, what the algorithm for doing these is that we take one, each one of these pieces of cover art and we zoom it down to one pixel. And that is a representative color of that. So this entire page of cover art that you see here is all the same shade of uh, green that is that you see at the pick in the, in the color picker is exactly the same shade. But since they're not all just homogeneous colors, um, this is what they, they they come to in the end. 
And um, you know, you can just play with it. It loads, uh, you know, different colors. Some pages are definitely more consistent in color. You have, you know, all look. Yeah, this looks very good. Some others are more more odd. Uh, you look at things like black, and there's going to be a bunch of death metal. They're all just black. Um, it's 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 fun to watch, and uh, you can see that there's also, you know, some of the light blue can be techno, some of the light turquoise green can be a little more new agey, purple is about rhythm and blues. So, and as Alistair pointed out a couple of days ago, there is actual research that talks about, yeah, there is correlation between uh, the cover art colors and so forth and genres of music that they represent. So here is a tool to go figure out, uh, you know, explore this yourself. And we're hoping to actually push this live onto uh, Mix and Brains in the next week. Hopefully Wednesday or Thursday sometime if I can get all the, the other scripts tied up in the back end. Um, we hammered this out in a hack day sort of style, which of course, you know, it, it bled over to the rest of the week, but so that's just how these things go. But still, being able to create a feature like this uh, and our team take a break from all the serious things we're doing and knock out some stupid feature that's judging colors by, uh, judging music by color, and it still works is a, a rather fun thing to be doing. That's lesson rent. An awful lot of things, which has been really uh, very fun and exciting. And um, I think there's a potential for having uh, more people come in. If uh, Hue Sound, like it's been getting internally really good. Uh, can't read the uh, the sign there, Cat Cat. But uh, it's been, uh, we've, we've received a good. Dap, 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 dap. Okay, can't see it. Needs a fatter pen. Anyway, or something. That said, uh, it's been a really lot of fun to to work in these listen brains features, and um, so I'll finish off on one thing with regards to listen brains, and that is to say that um, uh, we crossed a threshold in my opinion. There was somebody went uh, on Twitter a couple of weeks ago and said, "Hey, uh, as I know, there's a bunch of friends that follow my music stream and my music taste because um, you know they seem to think I have good music taste." I have left last FM. Listen Brains is now the place. Everyone bookmark this. This is where you can find me in the future, which is one person thinks that we're doing the right thing and told the world about it. That's a big freaking deal, which basically means there's a bunch more people in the background that aren't ready to be so vocal about it that have also switched. So this is this is a, a really strong sign that uh, that Listen Brains is on, on the right track, doing some interesting and fun things. I certainly, even from my data gulag perspective, have really enjoyed the, the work that we've been doing in the last uh, year, year and a half. That's it. Any questions? Uh, uh, not so much a question, but more of a comment. Uh, uh, Ten minutes ago, I found an issue from uh, for the. I, I wrote that in the in the chat. The music player I use is open source. It's called Strawberry, and it does uh, scrubbing to listen brains. Uh, and it has a, a little heart or the, the, the feedback feature, and uh, and they're currently not able to make it work with Listen Brains because we use MSIDs, and and so having MBIDs instead is going to be really really helpful. I think for uh, for uh, for third party uh, for yeah any third party code uh, be being able to move away from that and have MBIDs everywhere in the listens is going to be is going to allow to. Uh, actually have reliable data associated with the listens. So, so really, really helpful. Yeah. And the monkey's also spoken about uh, adding more of the music brains context around these things. So if you ever click on an artist and then get a card that says, oh, this is this artist, da, 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 da. click on a release, get the same thing for the release and, and so forth. <clears throat> these kinds of, uh, this is the perfect thing that you're talking about cross-pollinating the brains because we have all this data, we never used it. Now we have many opportunities use it and it's uh, sexy and interesting. Any other questions? Okay, so let's have a look at the schedule. Um, I believe we're now done with all of the uh, community stuff. Is that more or less right? And, and on time as well. And on time, very good. Shall we take a small break uh, or should we discuss uh, what should we talk about next before we take a break? Uh, yeah, we should discuss. Yeah, let's, let's, okay, we're let's planning discuss. a 10 break. Okay, let's do that. 
Um, does anybody else want to do the planning discussion? I don't want to just like continue yeah, we're on. Maybe Rio, do you want to lead this part? Uh, I guess I could. Uh, I need to find the planned scheduled things. Let me give me a moment. Okay. Yeah. Thanks for taking taking that over for me. Okay, so I see that we have basically, we are supposed to have a 60 minute session plan now, but I think it makes sense to anyway, uh, consider having a 30 minute one if we're gonna have a break, especially because we only have one thing marked 60 minutes in the proposed topics. I, so, I, wonder, I wonder if it's um, not necessarily useful to consider these in terms of 30 minute, 60 minute sessions and, and especially to say, oh, we have to do all the 60 minute ones first and all the 30 minute ones second. Sure, sure. I mean, I was just checking the schedule we had, had like slots for 30 and 60, 60 but it probably doesn't even matter, honestly. Right. I, 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 would, I would say, I think Rob, Rob mentioned this as well. Um, let's just either start from the top or order them based on interest and go. Okay, so, uh, if we look at order of interest, it does seem that the React server side rendering is, in, is the first. Uh, is this something that uh, seems, I mean, Alastair, you were the one who proposed this. What are you hoping to like run this as well? I can, I can run it. Okay. So how do people feel about doing that next? Is it fine? Is it too much as a first topic? Okay, let's let's start with that after the break. Okay, then we can start with that, and then uh, maybe if we're already doing a big programming one, that we can find something else different before people get too annoyed with it. So maybe we can have a more user-friendly first day and leave more programming for tomorrow. So maybe improving documentation could be next. Which is, is also, of course, like code wise, but it's also a bit more like for everyone. So, like, number seven, it's like, like slide seven right now. Uh, I'll move this up. I just yeah. moved it. Second. I'll unmove it. Okay. <laughs> so, I think we can do those two first, and then uh, let's see how we feel about the, what we want to talk about later. I don't know how people feel about that. Okay, so let's have a break first. And how long should we break for? Rob, did you have a specific idea? Well, given that we've just had a longer lunch break, let's go for 15 minutes, I'd say. So, uh, uh, so that's 19 minutes is the, the bottom of the half hour. So let's just uh, go for less 20 minutes. Okay, yeah, so let's try to be there at half past, or I guess hour past for whoever is in weird time, line, time zones. <laughs> okay, see you soon.
using uh, flask um, and ginger templates um, and we've started running into problems. So for example, uh, in some pages in the profile page, the top of the page is uh, rendered in Flask and then the next little bit down is rendered in React and then there's a little bit which is rendered in Flask again and then there's the main application which is rendered in React. And it's, it's one of these things that are starting to get complex. It's um, a mess. It's, it's a mess, Nicholas says. Um, so I thought this could be an interesting point of discussion simply because I know that uh, music brands and book brands uh, both do react rendering HTML on the server side and sending it through to the client. Um, I think one so 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 I, I was interested in getting feedback from from those teams in seeing uh, how that works for them and if that's something that we want to do in listen brains. Um, one other thing I, I would add is that this is something that I, I mentioned to, to Rob and Monkey just over lunch, um, which I, I certainly see a difference in generations of programmers who program for the web, where, where you know, when I came in 20 years ago, uh, you render things on the server and you submit HTML to the client and the client consumes that HTML. And it has huge number of advantages um, when considering things like scraping. Okay, maybe maybe we don't have to consider scraping too much because we have an API. Um, but considering search engines, um, you know, the, this this concept of being able to go to a URL and consume HTML, uh, we think is still is still a really good model that we should be following, and we shouldn't necessarily be you know, serving a blank HTML page and megabytes of JavaScript and, and rendering everything on, uh, on, on the client side. Um, we know that certainly within music brains, uh, there are people who have strong opinions about, um, about running JavaScript on their computers. Um, I, I personally don't think that we should necessarily 100% try and make something that works only you know com completely with html and then enhance with javascript i am not i'm not 100 percent in that camp um but i think uh that there are options for being able to do something like uh do all of the templates for for listen brains in react um do server side rendering somehow serve html out uh hydrate the page and be able to do interactive react from that point and in the very, very small cases where JavaScript isn't on the client, um, still be able to have links and serve HTML and make things work as expected. Um, so I guess that was sort of the, the general introduction. Um, the, one of the reasons, again, why I was saying why I, why I proposed it as a topic here was because I know that Music Brains does this. Um, and I'm sort of generally interested in knowing how that's going for you, um, whether you think the way that you're doing it is the right way to do it, um, and if so, how can we reuse what you have to do the same in Listen Brains? Yeah, I could um, talk about that. Um, so Music Brains actually has an interesting problem in this regard because and I assume the Python projects would too, and that how do you have the request served by Perl and then have the templates rendered by JavaScript. So what we did is we have a separate Node.js server, which the Perl communicates with over a socket in the same container. And it says, I want this template rendered or this JavaScript file containing this component. And it uses this set of props and just give me back the H HTML. And then we return that as the response from Perl. Um, but this solution, I, I think we came up with this in like 2015, which I don't, 
I don't think the state of React server side rendering was even very developed in that year. So there might actually be like much more uh, established solutions by now. But our implementation is also like very finely tuned for how we uh, just how we serve our pages and how we handle internationalization and everything. So uh, replacing it would probably be quite difficult, but it, it actually works quite well for us. And we do still have the same problem you mentioned where parts of the page will be rendered by a template toolkit in some cases, and then we have to hydrate React components on top of that. And it's, it is very messy. Um, and one of the major problems with that is when you hydrate a component, you have to hydrate it with the exact same props. Otherwise React will say, oh, the content differs. This is a mistake and will spam a bunch of warnings and probably have undefined behavior. So uh, we actually have to embed a lot of uh, props as JSON in our HTML just to be able to hydrate things. And right, so, so the, pa the page is effectively twice as big because you've got yeah. the, rendered, the rendered content and the, the, the same props, right? Right, we've, and we've had like bugs, you could say in the past where we were serving pages that had like several megabytes of JSON embedded in them. And a year later, we finally noticed and fixed it and noticed the bandwidth dropped significantly on our graphs, and, <laughs> but uh, it's it's a hard thing to to test for unless you're actively looking and inspecting all your HTML all the time. But um, the the main advantage is for us were really the fact that we can now share uh, our, all our components on both the server and client. Like before, we would have three different implementations of the same component, one in template toolkit, one in knockout, one in react. And now we can just have a single shared implementation. I, I guess in, in our case for listen brains, um, all of our main data display pages are only written in react. That, that is we, we have, we have the, the sort of the Chrome of the page in, um, in Jinja. Um, but we, we have this, um, this process where we, we actually do send props uh, in JSON. Um, the idea being that uh, that first render, um, we make sure that that first render has all the props available in the HTML so that we don't have the round trip of another uh, API call. Um, which, uh, which in itself also has its uh, uh, possible security implications because we're sending, uh, we're sending tokens that we probably uh, shouldn't and they're right there on the page instead of uh, I don't know using cookies or something like that to uh, to have more more secure uh, props uh, use it. Although that being said, I think that's uh, that's another can of worms that we uh, we have to open at some time. But, I uh, should mention that the the data leak we had early in the year was unfortunately due to how we embed props as JSON in our HTML okay. for React. So that is a very important thing to consider if you are serializing objects that potentially have private data in them. Um, one thing that helped us with uh, combining uh, JavaScript code with uh, Perl was to define uh, uh, type in JavaScript. So we use flow for typing. Maybe you can do the same with TypeScript. Um, and I have to, to check that uh, what we send from Perl effectively uh, match the type we define in uh, JavaScript. So it's not uh, out of the box. You have to define your own types uh, to work on in both languages. No, so that will be Python and, and uh, JavaScript for um, Mon Monkey and I actually did some experiments uh, over six months ago, um, but it turns out that there are ways of 
converting Pydentic classes to TypeScript type definitions. Um, and we, we kind of got it working. It's, it, it involved a little bit of, of, of hackery. Yeah, hack, hacking around. Um, but uh, actually, actually, the fact that, um, that we can do that means that we, we could get around uh, that by, by, yeah, by defining types in Python and then automatically making those TypeScript types available, um, which, would, which would help there. Well, we, we had uh, some edge cases about typing, like uh, Boolean be, being defined as a string okay. on some site. So that was uh, not, uh, that was working fine when we were all uh, doing that in Perl because it, it was automatically doing the conversion. But we had uh, this kind of errors when uh, switching to uh, JavaScript plus something else. Um, bitmap. Or, or I mean, music brands people in general. Given that it was it was interesting to to hear this comment about um, about how you were doing this before sort of the the React JavaScript server side stuff had had taken off. Um, so I, I know, for example, I've I've actually I've spoken on to people on other projects about this, and you know we've got exactly the same problem: big big sort of fat React front end with a with a Django back end. Um, and of course, most most people point at something like Next JS as a as a comment of saying, "Look, this does server side rendering and it's perfect. Why don't we just use this?" Um, but of course, that uh, omits the fact that the way the way that that works is by running a web server in JavaScript and hooking up with React, and and, and so in that case, your entire pipeline is JavaScript. But we we do have this split. Um, so the question, uh, do, do you think it's worth looking into other tools which have come up since you started uh, the, the Music Brains pattern? Or do you think that this Music Brains pattern of a, of a node server with a socket is stable enough that, that it would be worth us just copying it? Um, I, th I think our current implementation is very stable for us, but I would I'd also be interested in seeing like how other projects handle this too, because they might have might be a much better solution that people have come up with in the past few years that we just ignored because we've been focusing on other stuff. And um, yeah, so I'd, I'd I'd be interested in how other projects handle this, but I um, I did a I did a oh this is well, no okay so I, I just did a really a Google search, you know, Django React service side rendering. Um, it popped up something. There's no date. It says May 13. Maybe that's this year. Um, but honestly, it's exactly the same. It, it it's doing a um, in this case an HTTP request to a to a node server uh, to render the HTML. So um, it certainly seems that that pattern uh, in in the case that you have a you have a non JavaScript server. Um, it certainly seems that that is the is the common pattern that people uh, that people use. Yeah, to be clear, it's it's not actually a very uh, difficult thing to implement. So I, I assume it's like an established pattern people have found. Right. Um, it seems that seems quite odd to me as a way to implement it, but I, I guess if that's uh, if that's what what people are doing and. And the accepted solution for it, and it's stable, and it works okay, and it's not a, a ton of overhead. I think uh, I think it would probably be a generally a good thing to have on all the projects that can uh, make use of it. I also mentioned that um, I was reading some upcoming changes that are happening in React version 18. And there's apparently tons of improvements they're planning for how server-side rendering is handled and hydration. And I'm not sure of the specific details, but it might uh, 
that might improve the situation a lot and it's worth like looking into how that would work. Is, is that out yet or is that like the next version? I believe it's in uh, alpha state right now, but they already use it in production at Facebook apparently. So it, I guess it's stable for them. Uh, any any other comments? Um, I'm 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 nominally interested in in hearing from from Akshat, uh, just sort of in in terms of a uh, of a new let's say new generation of of front end programmer. Um, does does this does this sort of pattern make sense to you? Do you understand the reasoning behind it? Uh, is anything unusual uh, in it? Just opinions i do understand uh, the pattern that's uh, that you are talking about but like uh, personally i have i haven't like heard much of, about it so obviously i would have to do some research about it but uh, if you guys say that this is like a common pattern and it's like proven and it's working around so i don't think that should be much of a problem but like uh, again i do have the point about uh, like are we going to completely ignore uh, client side rendering then like are we focused on building apps that uh, that will only follow service identity, or we can have a mix of both? Right. So, so, so we we mentioned hydrating a few times. Do you, do you know what hydrating is? Uh, if you could clarify that. that would so, be so, so hydrating is a is a technique in React where you can send HTML to the client, and then you can ask React to take over the HTML and suddenly it becomes an interactive react application okay okay after um, you have received the html file right okay. so, so, so that makes sense so so the, the the trick is the trick is then that um what we're trying to work out is a way that that first request that you make that you receive html uh, because you know we see so many web applications these days which are uh which send you know a, a, a blank uh, HTML page and some JavaScript and do everything on the client. And certainly the way that Music Brains has worked forever is to is to return HTML. Um, and in terms of the history of the web and and you know what what has traditionally been returned uh, in in websites, um, I think we we like the idea of of continually continuing to return HTML. I think that makes sense. Like uh, that's like an absolute like win-win for us as well. And uh, going forward also, that's a good option. And uh, I think Bitmap mentioned about connecting to the node server. I, I personally don't know much about it. And I personally don't even know much about Next.js as of now to make comments on that. So I would leave that to you guys for now to decide. But uh, if the implementations are good, uh, that's great. And we can follow up on this maybe in like a week from my end. Like I can give more suggestions in a week. Uh, cool. I'll try to understand. Yeah, yeah, makes sense. Uh, first, I, yeah, I also just want to add that our clientele, so to speak, are for one a lot of older people. Uh, we did a survey a couple of years back where it was like most Music Brains user are thirty plus, forty plus. Um, so that's one thing. Another thing is that. We have a big open source people who are using us uh, and there's generally in in like the hacker community uh, a dislike for websites that work only with javascript uh, enabled uh, so so even even without all the other all the other reasons for why you want a website to work without javascript our specific user base has an additional warrant for being able to not turn on JavaScript on, on top of that. I, I think a, um, a counter to that point, like I, I, I completely agree with you there. And I, I know that um, uh, there are a lot of people who have problems with, you know, running non-free JavaScript, for example. Um, so so in, in a sense, I mean, 99% of our JavaScript is free JavaScript anyway so so the thing is we we are um 
we're, we've reached a point where we know that JavaScript is necessary to make things like brain player work, right? So, so um, I, I guess the, the question here is to see, can we find a, a middle ground that um, if someone is adamant on not running JavaScript on their browser, can they actually still navigate listen brains? Because as of now, they cannot. Um, yeah, yeah so that's, that's a good point. point that uh, that was previously the case. There was only only HTML before we introduced React, so it would have worked everywhere all, all the time. Uh, and it's no longer the case since we have React, and uh, and the, those pages just don't don't show anything if you if you don't have JavaScript uh, enabled. So we've lost functionality effectively by adding more fancy functionality, which uh, is never uh, really the the right way to go, I guess. Uh, yeah, one, one thing. Server-side rendering would give us uh, going back to at least having a, a functional HTML base that's gen then enhanced instead of being replaced. So in Music Brains, we've constantly kept tried to at least make it so that you can always view all the data and browse all the data without JavaScript on, but pretty often you don't need JavaScript to edit the data. And I think that I could see that as a similar thing in in listen branch, where you know you can check your uh, check your like uh, history and things like that with the JavaScript. But if you want to use something fancy or a toy or something, so like French player or like uh, Q sound or you know anything that might require JavaScript and it's not a base core component of, of you know the actual listening and scrubbing or whatever you want to call it the mechanism, then. I think would be perfectly justifiable if done JavaScript only if it's not possible to do it in any other way, which sometimes it won't be, right? So like I know, for example, I mean, Michael can talk more about this, but when we recently introduced the pagination for, for releases, we specifically added, like that uses JavaScript heavily, and then we, local JavaScript, right? And then we introduced a, a second mechanism that is much lower and kind of more annoying, but still allows you to, if needed, browse the whole release information without JAP. Right. Basically, what we do there is uh, we have links to like expand to show more tracks. But um, if you have JavaScript enabled, there's an event on the link which will cancel the default action, which is to follow the link and it'll just render a JavaScript component instead. But if you have JavaScript disabled, it'll actually follow the link and go to a paginated version of the track list. I, I, was, I was literally just talking to Monkey about that uh, half an hour ago about uh, as a proposed way of, of paging through listens. So yeah, that sounds like uh, exactly the kind of thing that we would want to do. Yeah. Another, another thing that, that was uh, touched on in these discussions the past few days is, is making sure that uh, that uh, browser navigation is uh, also unbroken, meaning uh, you don't uh, suddenly lose the ability to go back to a page by its uh, a specific URL, uh, which I think I think they're not really going to be a, a huge problem with that. There, there, there are tools that exist for React that handle uh, router navigation uh, really well, and if we implement that correctly, it, uh, we shouldn't have any problem with uh, with that sort of, sort of stuff. We already do some some browser navigation manipulation with uh, with Listen Brains to to keep that functionality. I really don't think that would be uh, an issue. I mean, it's a it's a a, a general issue with the uh, server side rendering and with React stuff. But there's again, there's tools, and we're aware of uh, of those pitfalls, so I, I wouldn't be too worried about that. Uh, I think uh, Akshat wanted to speak. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I say like we should pick one project and like finalize the structure for it. Like, because we keep on having like talks and like, uh, currently we are discussing on what's going on with MV and uh, what should be done with LB regarding that. So I think we should like pick one project and finalize the structure for it and see what are the consequences and what are the pros for it. That would make more sense so that we have finalized the structure and 
maybe we can finalize it for the next 5 to 10 years maybe that could be a very good investment i would say so so uh i i think the the big thing here is that knowing that uh music brains already does this um and but given that music brains is let's say the odd one out in terms of language implementation um and so we want to try this with with a python application um i think i think you're right in in listen brains um per personally to me i i think this discussion is is mostly resolved it, it sort of answered most of the questions that i had um and i i definitely think that this is something that we should uh, we should give a go in uh in listen brains um i i did want to make one comment i i see rob's been uh sitting in the corner um uh there and and point pointing out that this does mean that html is no longer going to exist um if we do all of our rendering in react um and that's a new technology to learn um which may be something that has to be considered in in the in the grand scheme of things i just want to say that if i've managed to learn react it's not that hard i i i, mean, I agree i mean i i write a lot of react now as well um and i mean i went to uni for english come on <laughs> i mean learning react is is obviously not something that's very difficult to do but just you know amongst all the other things i need to be doing it's tough to pick up for uh, yet another toolkit like this sure i mean i like, I, I, i expect that like at least my experience with music brains code is that as, as soon as you have like a bunch of files done a lot of it is just going to be pretty low hanging fruit where you don't have to touch a lot of the hardcore react details like we for example we have like a few files that use state and then mostly you can just use those as a basis for all the other files that use state you know things like that so like there's actually a lot less learning for like like as, as in one go i I, I think per, perhaps perhaps my comment is a little hyperbolic in that of course is html um it's just that it's not in a jinja template file um so yeah i mean I mean most yeah. of our react is html in in react files i mean right Ex exactly exactly and so so it's once you get that interactive functionality if you don't need interactive functionality well hey it's just html so so not much not much uh, and you know my my offer for doing a quality react versus accounting sort of cross pollination training is still open out there i have also prefer Uh, if we could keep around Jinja templates, I can write React, but uh, I prefer writing Jinja code. Um, how how many how many big React projects have you been involved in? Just just out of curiosity. No, uh, only listen to him. <laughs> right, 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 right. Um, I, sure. I I mean I I completely understand. Um, I. in 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 my experience for interactive front end stuff it's it's been really nice um i think uh given that music brains uses it given that book brains uses it um it's the uh let's let's call it the 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 natural progression um to to make the other applications sort of more interactive um, given that listen brains already does use it um but then then there's just that next step i mean especially like like monty said the the um the question of that we we had something and we've technically regressed um because it no longer works without javascript um and so this is sort of partially going towards uh, resolving that issue make, making it uh making it work without javascript again um but also sort of resolving some of the uh the deeper lying um architectural differences between what you may consider a, a single page app that you know serves only javascript and consumes only vr and api um and sort of what we might call the more traditional web app which has real urls that that return real html um i'm i'm happy with that discussion unless there's uh anything else that anyone really wants to wants to talk on i i, I think there's a uh, a few specific uh uh 
uh, things that we can do to, to give this a go and see if it works. Um, and we can certainly try it and see see how it ends up. And if it's hugely problematic, well, maybe we can come back to the table and see uh, see if there are any other solutions. Well, I just want to say that I think that uh, in general, both Michael and I, I mean, especially Michael, if there's hard other stuff, can uh, certainly give a hand with the uh, React issues as well. I mean, Michael has researched all sorts of ways of doing things smartly. So, you know, before reinventing the wheel, I would suggest always talking to the Music Brains team, and especially with Michael about it. And, I, I, uh, um, I did just uh, paste a link into RC. Um, again, just my basic Google search. There are Python libraries that sort of appear to wrap all of this up in a single render function that you pass in a, a dictionary of props and a JSX file to render and it just does everything. Um, you know, it does, does the connection to a, um, to a render server and takes care of all of that. So it looks like, uh, so it looks like that's, uh, that's fine. One uh, one thing that I'm worried about, uh, or slightly worried, is uh, that we do all the routing and all the navigation in uh, in Python, uh, and I don't know how that interacts with uh, with a single page app where uh, theoretically the navbar would be all in React and all the routing would be done with React Router or something like that. I mean, as far as I understand, we do pretty much all the routing routing in Perl ourselves, right? Um, and the same mistake, in, like missing something we have pretty much everything just going back to Perl. Michael can confirm yeah we don't use any uh, client side routing at all but for for example in your um next page uh for for paging do you update the url when you go onto the next page in the client if it's if it's fully react based so next page in... for navigation in a page of results for example right so we just uh, that's not react right that, query yeah that's not hydrate the right server now. again for another page we don't do it uh, very nicely at the moment but but sorry there, there was a comment that on yeah on one so on the, one page yeah on one so page the server. pagination for, for releases we don't actually do pagination with, when we're doing react we just load the whole thing with hydration so we just load the full yeah. uh, track list in that case we only but, have pagination if we have uh, if we have like the non-reactive way of doing it. So in that sense, we don't have this problem. But we, we plan to to replace this with a component that can just uh, query uh, web service endpoint and load the data and render uh, from the client side the HTML uh, that is needed for the next page and still keep the previous page in memory of the client so you can navigate quickly uh, backwards if you need if you want to yeah so we're not in the, the same answer to that question is we haven't had to deal with that question yet but uh... no, not quite yet a single page application uh, I guess yeah. uh, I guess that's the 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 one uh, the one thing I'm wondering how how that works because because on 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 book brains it's all it's all JavaScript all the back end is is handled with Node and etc so so there's there's less issues there uh, but I'm sure I'm sure someone's got to have solved uh, solved that issue I don't think uh, and then one way or another we we're doing uh, um, browser history manipulation currently so I'm I'm sure we can solve the issue uh issues that we could, that we would run into that would be an interesting an interesting um problem to solve uh that's going to affect all the projects that combine uh, uh python and uh and react if we're still interested in uh, in having single page applications which is uh, another story as well the 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 interesting sort of perhaps difference between music brains and listen brains in this in this case is is this sort of overarching uh, attempt to have a single page app so that you can have one brains player and you can navigate from page to page and keep brains player playing in the background. So you can say, hey, I'm, I'm, in, um, I'm viewing my listens and then I can see that this was listened to by a different person. You click that and it takes you to that person's profile, but the URL updates as well. So if you click refresh or if you want to share that link, 
to somebody, they can they can visit the same link. Um, I, I think what that means we're going to have to do is we're going to have to duplicate routing um, both in the React app and in Flask, so that if you if you visit the URL in Flask, then um, then it's going to get the right database data from the from the um, yeah. from the server and and pass that to the renderer. Um, but then if you're if you're navigating uh, within React, you use something like React Router or some other uh, some other state management tool. Um, that allows you to to load a different page. I guess that answers it, and it's uh, you just duplicate the navigation. Yeah, um, interesting. Uh, thanks, everyone. Uh, back to you, Rio. Okay, so uh, let's do one more topic, and then have a break. Um, sorry, uh, or do just, we want to have... just to sorry. jump in, um, has anyone been taking minutes? Uh, no, but thankfully, uh, there's a YouTube video being uh, yeah, yeah. Um, all right, let me let me open up the link to the minutes, which is which is in that spreadsheet, and I will write a summary of this this discussion. Thanks. So yeah, like, uh, how are people feeling? Do we have the energy for one more? I need a cup of tea. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 I would like to get some water on whatever. So we should take a five minute break anyway. Yes. But you're thinking whether five minutes are a bit longer. Okay, let's do five minutes then. Okay.
second call. People play straight to make it back. I said people, not monkeys. That's vicious. You could load up. I'm still waiting for the opportunity to make the comment. It's like, ah, oh, this is not my circus. These are not my monkey. Oh, well, all of these are not my monkeys, except that one. He's funny. Sorry, 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 sorry. It's okay. It's okay. It's okay. <laughs> okay, so who's on the list for this? It's uh, at least the uh, cat cat sass and I sass around. Last call for sass. Rob, did you did you leave your stash in the house? Oh uh, yes, yes. I mean, that yeah, was I a bad mean, plan. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, okay. That's that's what Zaz does at my house, right? So there he is. Nice boobs, Zaz. <laughs> so I I missed the last two minutes before that. Zaz is in his house. Yeah, just, just saying, I'm not sure that whether nudes are allowed by YouTube, so Seth, maybe make sure that that's not in the picture too much. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, uh, okay, uh, is uh, Karthik around, Lucifer? Yeah, I'm around. Okay, then I guess everyone who's listed for this is around at least, so we should start. Do you want to present, since you proposed? Yeah, sure, I'll start. Yeah, so um, as mentioned in the docs, uh, many of our services like solar and the spark cluster are maintained by just one person. Like uh, most of the ser uh, ser server stuff is done by Givenzo and most of the spark cluster stuff is done by me. Uh, so it uh, some of the times we might be unavailable or uh, and a fix might be needed urgently. And also it helps in general if some other person in the team is also familiar with the stuff to help with it. Uh, so there is some documentation in Syswiki, but some of it might be incomplete or some of it might be totally missing. So thoughts on how to improve this? So that just one person is not responsible for a service, and maybe at least two. I uh, mean, I, I think one can take on the responsibility for day-to-day -day work, but if there should be backup for a someone to step in if in, uh, the lead is not available. So Alistair's okay. done, done some of that, uh, stepping in, looking at things and uh, realizing the documentation is out of date, poor or non-existent, uh, and then writing some of it, which is really good. Um, and recently, I know that the Music Friends team has done a little bit of um, you know, I sort of suggested that they take a couple of tickets uh, from their domain and pass it to the person on the right and then make them do a couple of tickets and peer reviews and then uh, effort to do a little bit more cross-pollination between the positions so that, uh, you know, if you can walk a kilometer in somebody else's shoes, you have a better understanding as to what their day-to-day -day life is like. And I kind of get the feeling that this is a similar sort of thing where we do spend a lot of time being very focused on moving in the right direction, improving things and so forth. <coughs> Excuse me, but we're not necessarily doing uh, cross-training and you know, sort of looking at what other people are doing much. I wonder if it would make sense on a per project basis or you know one or two projects to have a day or to have two days where we we'll actually work uh, instead of a hack day style like we just did for the QSound stuff, instead say, let's go attack some of these uh, documentation bits. So let's attack some of the things for, uh, let's say, the Spark server, right? And then uh, out there and I jump in and to try and do some of these uh, Spark server tasks. And when we find that, uh, that we have no idea how to do that and identify what things need to be done, and the three of us can also attack at the same time with Lucifer's help, like, okay, we actually do this, do this, and then we document these things at the same time. 
I think that would be a good way of doing it because one of the things that I'm finding is, um, you know, if we don't have a specific person to do it, it just simply isn't going to get done. And documentation is one of those classical things that we just simply don't have a person that is uh, specifically designed to be our documentation person, which kind of begs the question, is that something that we're ready for? Right, somebody who is a fairly technical person who's not necessarily a programmer, who is just sort of bouncing around and they're spending time to be, uh, you know, maybe spend a couple of weeks on on listen brains and dig deep into some of the documentation, and then take a break and then go dig deep on acoustic brains and write some document documentation there. Are we ready so, for something like that? I think. Uh... That really depends on what you're talking about with this. Are you talking about user-facing documentation or developer-facing documentation? If you want the first, I think that is certainly something that would be interesting, but the, and that's more open to people to do. If you want the second, this is really cool, but you probably do need someone with at least a fair understanding of the projects and development. I mean, you don't need to know everything obviously but uh, i don't think that you can have a, a person who doesn't speak any of the things that are being written and and, and still completely figure all the documentation out otherwise you just have someone pestering the team members to help with the documentation which i mean might in itself help but it's not I, exactly I, the same yeah I, I think it would and the few organizations where i worked where there was actually good technical documentation I had somebody who was actually, uh, you know, a fairly technical person, but not a programmer, who then go around and pester people to, to okay, explain to me how this thing really works from a internal documentation perspective. And this person would also be responsible for an external thing. So we could say like, okay, spend a third of your time doing external documentation and two thirds of your time working with team members to, to build internal documentation so that these things improve. Um, that's, again, it's another one of those things that makes me kind of worried because that's a, a position that needs a little bit of management that um, we don't have a lot of management. We have a lot of uh, people hacking on things. So this is something I kind of need to think about. But for some of the internal things, it might be really worthwhile for us to actually do what I suggested, like not a hackathon, but a documentation sprint to get some of these things done. I would really be interested in seeing that happen and seeing how that works. Uh, both for internal and external documentation. Like I think both of them are needed, and that both of them could really benefit from an approach like that, where we, as a, we, a team, get at least gets a day to specifically, or possibly the entire team gets a day to hack on the ex internal documentation, and also possibly where the community gets a day to hack with the team on the external documentation. And yeah, yeah. I was thinking that uh, since like I was getting started with a few projects recently, so I could take the responsibility of improving the documentation on the go. So like uh, when I was trying to understand the MB Docker or something was going around that side, or when I'm trying to jump into maybe critique brains. So when I'm jumping in and as I face the problems, I could uh, be tagging along and improving the documentation. Uh, for now i could do with the external documentation and after a while i could uh, start with the internal as well so i could take up the responsibility of as i'm jumping into the projects and making them on the go i think One. that's a that's a really good idea and it's very honorable of you to do that i'm already seeing you uh jump into quite a few things i think a more moderate approach in the, in the beginning might be to do something like keeping a list of okay i found this documentation to be lacking then enter a ticket for it, right? And as you find documentation that's lacking, then what we could do, pick, I don't know, maybe sometime in January, we could actually take a week and say, as an entire team, not just as a listen rights team, but as a meta rights team, this is our documentation week. And then we can also say, all right, we're all planning ahead for this week as being our documentation week. And then we can tell people who are uh, contributors and other uh, users of our software, to really be bring a little bit more of a focus to the external side of things. And we, the team, that bring the focus on the internal uh, you know, procedures of what, how things should be working. And because I, I think this is going to be very difficult to pull off if we have like one person in the corner that's chasing after developers to do these things. 
And then a developer is just like, well, I'm kind of really busy writing code. It's off with the documentation. But if we all have a week to focus on this, I think we're going to do a much better job of it. And we're all going to be walking in each other's shoes and stepping on each other's toes at the same time. Ivan de Navas. Yes, like we have hands up. So Ivan first. Oh. Okay. Um, um, last year, I think it was Reo who uh, handled the uh, update of uh, our internal documentation for uh, deploying uh, Music Brand server. And it took a lot of time and we had to be the three of us involved into uh, providing the information because uh, nobody had, had the, the full information. And um, uh, we have another documentation about uh, the APA for uh, its technical documentation, but external. And we have uh, other bit of documentation about the database and, and so on. So it's uh, very parcelar. And uh, maybe what we are missing is uh, a documentation about the documentation. I mean, if we, we had a, an index, uh, a file to say, okay, we need uh, this, this documentation, this, 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 and this. Maybe we could keep track of uh, what has to be made available and uh, up to date, at least. Uh, per, yeah, per that project. sounds kind of like that sounds kind of like what Rob proposed the uh, Akshat would do. Yeah, and do I, documentation and requirements and yeah. and, and those that would be per project, and maybe we can have guidelines about. Uh, making uh, this kind of documentation uh, for MetaBrains uh, mm -hmm. Yes, one, general, thing I want to, yeah, say, one thing I would note about this is when we did, when I wrote the deployment documentation, it was pretty much the same situation Akshat mentioned, where basically I wanted to learn to deploy the system. I had, I went to check the documentation. The documentation was not good enough for me to deploy the system without knowing things. And that's what, you know, made me update the documentation. So in that sense, it's kind of Rob's idea of kind of stepping into different people's jobs, so to say, and it, it really worked for that at least. Uh, I, I think, um, I, I mean, again, I comment in, in mostly in agreement with, uh, with, with all of this, um, but specifically tied into this discussion between Aksha and, and Rob. Um, I just wanted to make a comment that uh, our documentation improved a lot when Lucifer joined and sat down in exactly the same point that you say Rio sat down and said, hey, how does X work? Um, but also sort of extending that things like, why does this work like this? It's a bit stupid. Surely you should do it like this and say like, like we, we get, you, you get blind to the, the terrible systems that we have that everyone's just learned to work around um, and so having having someone new come in is is always incredible um, and so yes Aksha every time you see something that looks confusing to you don't assume that it's confusing for a specific reason um, write it down somewhere and ask us why is that done like that because it's possible that it's done like that because nobody thought about doing it any other way. Yes, as a quick note, that's also how music brains guidelines get changed pretty often, where it's like, well, we are doing it like that because 10 years ago, that was the only way we could do it, but we really don't need to do it like this anymore, but we don't really look through them. We just eventually figure it out when someone asks in the forum, like, this is a bit weird, why are we doing this? Yeah, I, th I think, uh... And and to 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 go exactly in the same direction, that that energy of like, hey, well, why is this like this? Uh, needs to be written down. It's not necessarily your job to fill out the documentation, but having that point of view and writing down all the questions that you have, all the holes that you see, and all the stuff, even if it seems like it's a, you know, maybe not a relevant question, just write everything down. And when we do get to doing. Uh, um, uh, teamwork for for fixing those. At least we have a list of uh, of questions to answer. And I think uh, I think uh, writing documentations uh, documentation together when you already have the questions that you need to answer is is much much easier than 
are arriving as the same team who doesn't have that has those blind spots to look at the documentation and say, well, uh, you know, what's what's missing? Because uh, because we don't necessarily see see it. Rob had raised his hand. So what I would propose we do is uh, take the period of time between now and the proposed documentation week and collect all of the tickets for all of the projects where we find documentation holes. And I hereby propose the week of January 17 through January 21 as a documentation week. Are we talking specifically code documentation or are we talking in general as in should we be yes. posting to the forums and asking people this like, is, hey yeah. i'm very specifically thinking we should tell uh, the forums the blog everyone else to basically invite them both to write tickets for like hey what documentation is for means needed and then please hey this is the week we're going to be focusing on this would you like to join us would you like to help and then we will have a number of things that we can give CapCat very precise instructions on that we might get things written if CapCat's on board with that. Um, and let's just focus on whatever it is that we need to do, right? I think uh, you know we internally will will need to know and focus on what we need to document for improving our documentation internally. I certainly have lots of questions around that, and I hope Zas is listening because. Uh, if the gateways tip over, which thankfully they don't, do, they don't do very often, I'd be very hard pressed to actually jump in and try to figure out how to do the gateways. So I think that's one of the things that I will have a, a bit of a, a focus on. Um, does anybody have any objections to that concept? Or does have anybody have objections to the, the date of January 17th? Oh, yes. your question, is your, that question was directly to the question about dates? OK, I'll get back to you in just a second. Uh, I might or might not be uh, traveling in Spain at the time. Oh, sorry. Really chances expensive. chances are I won't anymore. I mean, I'm going for Christmas. Chances are we're going we're coming back before that. Okay. But just saying, like I, I cannot guarantee full like availability that week. But likely I can manage. Yes. Okay. When when will you know? Uh, probably in a couple of weeks or so. I'm hoping. Okay, so so let's do this. Um, tentative date scheduled is the week of the 17th. Uh, we'll re we will circulate back around uh, in two weeks' time when Rio has his plans carefully uh, set. Everyone else who, who's going to be participating, make sure that the week stays open, or if something drastic comes up, then let us know. We'll figure out another date. And then at that point in time, we'll, we'll put up a blog post, community post, basically stating our intentions and asking for volunteers to help out. Alistair? Um, I just wanted to go back to sort of the, the very first part of this conversation. So, so this proposal to me looks really good for, uh, let's call it reactive documentation writing. So someone asking, um, hey, uh, I always wondered about X. Um, how, did, how does that work? Um, it's perhaps sort of implicit in, in, in the plan. Um, but I'm thinking about, uh, I mean, let, let's call them the, the unknown unknowns, right? The, the, the bits of the system that exist and very infrequently go wrong. Therefore, nobody knows that they exist and where they live and how to make them work and how to fix them. Um, is, is that something that, uh, so, so to take an example, I mean, even let's say Spark. Uh, you know, I, I have no idea. I don't even know how to log into the Spark cluster. You know what what the what the addresses are. Um, is is this something, Rob, that you think we would be attacking in in this week as well? Um, and and if so, perhaps the the more the more specific question: How do we surface the fact that we know that there are these very small bits of the project of of our infrastructure that are that are known by only one person? Um, I, I was hoping that really that, uh, that most of this would be uh, settled by us working for the next couple of months in understanding and like with an active eye towards identifying these particular tasks. Um, and then we would have a kickoff meeting uh, on the first, uh, like you know, perhaps uh, dev time on Monday 
uh, and actually say like, you know, what is it that we're tackling today and have a concerted effort to identify, uh, you know, single points of failure in the documentation or the knowledge in our infrastructure. So to spread it out and hopefully be able to address the, the points that you just put on the table. And okay, that's I, sufficient. I, I, think, I think that answers my question basically that we, we and until, until then we start un, unearthing potential places where we can make improvements. Okay, so I have on my calendar uh, noted down uh, for the dev meeting on November 1st that we should have a conversation around finishing the, finalizing the date for this. And, uh, you know, once we've done that, then we can post, uh, you know, hopefully we can also think about a little bit more what we want to do, perhaps start entering some tickets into JIRA with regards to our documentation, then also uh, organize JIRA and uh, get ready for having a call for public participation on this so we can get a lot of our documentation up to speed. I know there's a bunch of stuff that uh, I care about uh, fixing and improving. Um, and, uh, you know, because like, like I said, I'm kind of scared about buying blind with regards to the, uh, um, to the gateways and so forth. So there's a lot of stuff to be done. Um, and perhaps, you know, we can, we can find uh, people from the community and like, you know, strategically tap people on the shoulders. Uh, and I'm hoping that we can do some serious uh, shoulder tapping for Bob in particular um, to, to, to focus on more some of the, uh, the external documentation. Uh, so that the team can have a little bit more energy towards internal documentation and lending support to, to other people who are writing the external documentation. Yeah, I'm expecting that also smaller projects are probably completely or almost completely lacking external documentation. I mean, I don't know how many docs we have for critic brains, but I'm expecting it's close to zero. I'm not sure how many docs we have for book brains, but I understand it's not a lot. So like all those sorts of projects are also going to need some extra eyes on them and like i mean for book friends we can probably ask the community like let's say like ask the top x book friends editors for example about ideas of what is missing for critique brains i mean we might just want to start with the basics if we don't have them like how to write uh, and how to write a review I, I haven't checked the docs in a while maybe we have some but i mean these kinds of like outside of music brains i think external documentation drops down very quick. I'm not sure what the listen brain status is, but everywhere else there's very, very little. So that's certainly something where, uh, yeah, like we really need to possibly post on every specific forum and ask for, for help, uh, maybe specifically contact very active users and ask what they think they're missing. Of course, the main problem is active users already know a lot of the things even without the docs, but it's very hard to, you know, query new users because you have to find them first. So. Right. I mean, that kind of. I, I think one of the critical things that, uh, at least for the internal documentation, is that we need to really be aware of uh, trying to prioritize the things that are least documented, most critical, uh, so that we can actually really hone in on the point that Lucifer made about uh, a lack of documentation for, for, for jobs that are being done by one person only. Um, so don't even get me started on the number of jobs that I'm doing that nobody else wants to do because like Alistair is like fighting me two of it may I'm trying to learn some 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 accounting but uh, okay maybe that accounting is not the thing that we need to learn um, but uh, you know there's been so many things that live in my world that nobody else wants to do and every time I suggest that you know somebody else is cross training for you know the reactions I get are basically just you know this yeah. so. Um, you know, I've got a lot of shit jobs in my place that nobody wants, 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 wants anything to do with. So if anybody has any ideas for that, then... I'll, I'll, I'll learn this. accounting as long as I, as long as you also teach me how to siphon money out of the uh, foundation for my own purposes. I think that the name is Founded. Founded is <laughs> nope. how you siphon money out nope. of... It's called Creative Accounting. Is Rob going to strangle Alistair before anyone else finds out? Yep, yep. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, 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 I think I said that out loud and I uh, probably shouldn't have. That should have been your indoor voice, yes. <laughs> I, I, realize, I realize being in Spain just uh, like sort of just makes you know, indoor voices disappear well, it's, because no one in Spain seems to actually know how to use them. It's, it's incredible. What I do is I come into the office and I write code and then I get given money. Um, and this, this system works really well.
Okay, well, then, you know, let's not get you a counter one. <laughs> okay, um, I, I think, you know, we have a work cut our, of, out, out for ourselves on this particular topic, and it's um, time to move on to the topic. Uh, Karthik, is that uh, all we got for this point? So to sum up, we decided that uh, we will do a documentation week in the January. Till then, we will uh, write, uh, uh, make tickets and organize Jira. Um, uh, I did not understand what we decided for uh, filling up each other's shoes. Like, when are we going to uh, jump in some other's work and try to understand it? Uh, sorry, could you repeat the last two sentences? Yeah, uh, I asked, like, see, uh, li like I'm doing the Spark stuff and you are doing the data stuff. So uh, a week I do the data stuff and you do the Spark stuff. Do we have any plans on that? Or will that be decided in the future? No, um, I think what we ought to do is uh, get the documents presentation sprint done and see what we did. And then take a look at, um, hey, uh, do I think I could fill your shoes if I needed to do that, given the documentation we have. And uh, there's gonna be some tasks they're gonna be really daunting to do, like, uh, you know, when Alistair tries to take over uh, for me as the executive director, uh, you know, then we'll see how the documentation stacks up. Yeah, I, I would actually say that, yeah, like it seems like that's the best way to improve the documentation that we think is good, that we just wrote, it's gonna be yeah, like, write it then give it to someone who hasn't done this ever and then be like okay do it and then we're going to be like well that's a good start but it's missing half of the stuff and then we're going to get the correct documentation so like i think that that's the right order indeed yeah okay Makes by the way then i believe we're done back to you for um rio okay uh by the way how good is the documentation for the uh financial bits that you want other people to do, because if it's not good, then you probably need to start documenting that as well. There is almost no documentation because the, you know, I couldn't get well, anyone to, to follow this shit. This is something that's- Well, been given that if, right? even if something happens to you are screwed, then please, please, please work on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's ultimately, you know, if something happens to me, you guys need to hire three people to replace me. One of them will be an account. Right, um, and uh, you know several others. The thing that I've actually set out, and uh, I've already told Zaz about this. Uh, Zaz is going to be. Um, I'm going to so I have a one password password management keeper, and everything is in one vault right now. It's like everything's per personal professionals conflated. So between now and sometime next year, I'm going to start working on actually separating them into two separate vaults. And the key to the vault, the master key, uh, password key to this is going to be printed out and physically mailed to Zaz. So Zaz will be the keeper of the password for my, uh, the, the keyboard, keyboard vault, or the key to the password vault. So if something happens to me, that is going to be the key for unfucking things, right? But there's going to be so many things that will need to get unfucked that uh, one of the first steps is to hire an accountant. And at the very least, to actually let them take over the, the, the finances and drive the process from there. Otherwise, I mean, you guys have until next payday to work that part out. So, <laughs> is, this, is this before <laughs> or after Bass Factor? I mean, are we considering hiring an accountant anyway? Well, so the thing is, we have accountants, right? So, there's the, the monthly, quarterly uh, bookkeeping, which is reconciling all of our accounts and so forth, is a mostly done process. Um, and I can do that process in, you know, sometimes I get it done in a day, which really isn't bad. So that means that there's four days of accounting and about half a day worth of, uh, you know, filing taxes and so forth. And the grand scheme of things for running a nonprofit with a half a million dollars in of income, that's a very good amount of time we're spending in accounting. And my accountants don't understand how we do this, but that's fine. Um, so we don't really need many more accounting services, except like, you know, this is all stuck in my head. And if I needed to, like, the, the problem is, and I keep joking about like cross-training Alistair on, on, on like how to use QuickBooks, right? There's this whole task on, on learning QuickBooks, which is not actually MetaBase specific, right? And then, <laughs> and then there is the, uh, the, the, you know, actually learning how MetaBase does things and how the scripts, like how do we take things up transfer-wise and PayPal and, and like pull all that in, write that stuff so they can, you know, transfer that information so they can go. That stuff I can write write about, but 
where do I start on this, right? So this is this is something that gives me nightmares, but we're now at a point where uh, we Some actually have a large enough team where I could step aside for a day out of the month and actually you know, start working on these things and documenting myself out of existence. Which is yeah, you start somewhere because any documentation we have is better than none. So yes. even if it but seems it, minor, please. Yeah, and any it, it really needs to start with like making sure that the keys to the kingdom can be accessed and uh, Zaz is the, 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 the key person that like, you know, despite him like, you know, zoned out on my couch, I trust him a lot. Because I think he's entirely too lazy to try and work this all off. So, right, Saz? I just I just want to to quickly say that if you're looking for a QuickBook advice, we have a lot of Music Brains accounts that are offering uh, how to learn QuickBooks. So you can just <laughs> take your pick. <laughs> uh, that's a spam joke in case anyone didn't get it. Uh, Katka, do you want us to say something? Oh, yes. Hi. Um, it's a bit off topic right now. You're talking about the uh, money. Um, when it comes to documentation. I think we're done with the... Hmm? When it comes to documentation. I think we're done with money now. So yeah, go on. Yeah. We're talking a lot about the uh, code and setup and such documentation. When it comes to database entry documentation, we in uh, music brains we're pretty good with that. But when it comes to things like book brains, listen brains, and acoustic brains and such, we, I think we have very low amount of useful documentation for users. Like for example, yeah. book, now we have like one page and it, that's basically the same as when music brains had like dust one page that style guide and i mean i have lots of ideas um so i'm very kind of hyped for if we do this thing in january to write documentation i'm, I'm happy to write documentation for book brains data entry ideas i have i also but I, I do want people to to double check what i'm writing so it makes sense to them i'm a monkey you anybody interested yeah. in this to make sure so that one thing is one logic. thing about this yeah so I haven't actually used BookBrains that much, and I want to use BookBrains more. So I think I will be pretty happy to be a test user for the documentation. I mean, I probably know a bit more than I should for being the complete new newbie beginner, but uh, I will ah. certainly review that. And I mean, it's a kind of thing where we can certainly throw it by our community and be like, hey, people try to add some stuff to to book brains based on this, and I think it should work. But please do make a list of uh, ideas you have already so that we can, uh, because I mean, a week is actually not that much time to write good docs. So we might need to cooperate on that as well and whatnot. Yes, any ideas you have that what's missing, do already write them down and then, okay. Yep. Uh, it is still about this, then, then Katka and then Rob maybe? Yeah. So I, 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 what Fresno said here uh, to make tickets, assign them to me a style. And you, Rio, I'm, I'm happy because I work well with you. So I think we can work well on that. I also mm -hmm. think that um, uh, what you just said make, made a lot of sense. So okay. uh, anybody else also, if you haven't really used at book brands a lot and you coming in and you he you, you are you have put the they we need also nobody has ever used database and also people who have used database but haven't used book brands how it doesn't know how how it works so we write a style guide for people coming completely new in doesn't know anything but also people who coming from music brands who are expecting a sort of music brains way of doing it so so kind of maybe making a mistake based on music brains experience we to big take both these things into account yeah i think I that uh, a quick quick intro for book for music brains issue users would probably make a lot of sense so write that down we'll make tickets i mean at some point they expect we're going to have a community post and a blog post asking people for so here is where we're going to put tickets please go put tickets here and uh, then you can put them there but for now yes at least write it down in a file and then we can put Rob, go on. So, so I think uh, just one comment about Listen Brains. Uh, Listen Brains is going to require less documentation from a user perspective because I, it's a site that just we're, we're working more or less uh, to, to make a good user interface for it. 
the developer documentation is a little discombobulated, but it's there. Like some things could be really hard to find, but during this during this week, I think it could be very easy to just like reorganize some of our uh, API documentation. But the listen brain stuff is you know we've been uh, carefully watching in our peer reviews that somebody's writing a new endpoint and, and, and it's documented. So listen brains isn't really that bad. It's just that listen brains doesn't, I don't think really needs a lot of documentation for some of the user facing things, simply because the requirements of what a user needs to know is like drastically lower than something something like book brains or um, user brains. Uh, any more comments on this topic right now? Okay, I am seeing the summit uh, timetable again, and I'm seeing that we basically already did cleaning up and organizing this wiki. <laughs> Since a lot of this is basically going to be improving this wiki, but I don't know if uh, Lucifer still feels like we should have a brief chat on that specifically and what problems we have found on this wiki specifically, or if we think that's good enough. I think we covered most of it. Uh, one thing would be um, like a few days ago, uh, we thought of using GitHub Wiki uh, for uh, placing the documents so that they can be better searched or found. Like uh, I, uh, the SysWiki has many documents, but it is often difficult to find a particular one. So it would be nice if we could make it more organized or and find easy to find stuff. I, I agree. Um, I think Rob went through and deleted a whole bunch of things that he knows was from the old hosting infrastructure, um, which was uh, a good way to um, to clean it up. I mean, I mean to, to, to know, to, to, to have a, a smaller set of things to, to look at. Um, I know that there are still some pending tasks or questions in this topic. Um, uh, Zas pointed out uh, after we had done it that there are um, a number of you know, uh, files in SysWiki as well that are not strictly documentation pages that are also necessary. Um, so there are some, some sort of pending tasks or questions, I think, around uh, how should we finish cleaning this up? And where should we focus on putting things? And should we come up with any any structure uh, for documentation, et cetera, et cetera? Rob? Does, uh, does the GitHub Wiki have search capabilities? Pass? Because if it has search capabilities, then I think we're, um, we've already drastically improved our situation here. It's pass, let me, do a search in repository. Yes, so search, search is wiki. Cat course has a question. Cat course? Hi. Uh, documentation search right now? A skyline. I don't know about documentation for code, but it uses some form of Google. I think we very, very much oh, yeah. implement our own search for our own documentation. I, I even have a ticket for that. That's a separate. That's a separate point. That's a separate point. But I think that's actually a fair point that uh, we will want to make sure that our documentation search works a bit better than it currently does. Can you? Uh, you have a ticket. Just make sure when we when this whole thing comes up, again, make sure to link to that. Like when we have the posts and whatever, make sure to link to that. Uh, we can continue. Anything else about the sys wiki specific kind of part of this, or are we done with that? Uh, nothing from my side. Uh, does Zess have anything to add? I, I think I think he does, um, but I wonder if that could happen in a further discussion in the coming weeks. I, I'm just kind of wondering where Zaz is. <laughs> I mean. I think I, I think he's no that he, he's on my couch as per usual. He's just uh, off his, in his own little world. I am, but I I don't uh, I, I didn't hear just before. So, what was the question? The, the, 
the, the main question was, was following on from your discussion earlier in the week about um, if we move SysWiki documentation to the GitHub Wiki, what do we do with other non-documentation files in that repository, uh, keys, scripts, and, and such? Um, if we move uh, the, the documentation, that is the, the, the text, to the wiki, I think we can keep the code inside the sys wiki. I, I so agree. It will be separate. Yes. Oh, <clears throat> we could create um, another repository just for the code and link to the documentation. So I, I would prefer that, I think, because then we have less opportunity for, for, for crossing the streams. So all of that local host server setup uh, should get moved to a separate repository. And then what I think we should do is we should delete all of the pages that are in the repository, in the SysWiki repository, or at least move them to a subdirectory that says like archives, right? Please look well, at the wiki instead. You, you, you mean like a git commit history? I mean, we can delete them and then they're still in the history. I'm you, passing in, in Alistair's general direction. <laughs> <laughs> yes, whatever, right? Um, um, a, a, Small comment there, um, just to keep in mind, is that GitHub Wiki doesn't do subfolders. And we do have a bunch of subfolders for things like retired servers, uh, which are markdown documents. Um, mm -hmm. I, I don't think we need to have an in-depth discussion about that now, but just to keep in mind that if we do want to archive stuff, we're gonna to have to come up with a way to, to do that. Are we sufficiently done with this topic to move on? Uh, just uh, one thing. I can see uh, another advantage of separating uh, what is called uh, in the specific from what is documentation. Um, we could expose the documentation to the public more easily, I think, uh, if we keep uh, what is needed to, to be kept private uh, inside the SysWiki. You see what I mean? I think there's a lot of documentation which is not uh, readable by anyone because it is in the SysWiki, but it doesn't mean this documentation will not, will not be useful for other people. So I think we have too much private stuff in there. You see what I mean? So I think what we should do possibly during the documentation marathon is to actually look at that and say like, okay, so the only things that really ought to be in SysWiki are the bits that are sensitive to information that are per that, that pretty much only the teams would see, contract with employees with privacy agreements and all of that. Um, and anything that is a useful documentation for the broader public should be moved elsewhere. With that, let's move on to the next topic. We have uh, just under an hour. Ivan has his hand raised. Did you actually speak yet? I don't know. I, I, I was drifted up for a second, sorry. Yeah, I just, uh, about what you just, you just said about uh, um, having private information on GitHub, even in, in a private repository, do we have a plan if there is a, a failure from a GitHub and uh, we have SSH key or things like that, that go public, do we have uh, a plan to replace them or something? Sorry, I didn't quite uh, understand the essence of that question. So we have a private SSH key and things like that in the SysWiki. What if uh, some of this information goes public? Do we have a plan, a backup plan for this type of event? Not, not currently, no. No. Change all the passwords to SSH keys and panic? But we could um, work differently. And I think that's a problem to have all these secrets. 
like keys or things like that inside the history keys. That's not mean so bad. So we perhaps need to think about a better solution for just this password, SSH key, and things like that. So I don't know, but uh, if someone has better ideas for that, welcome. <laughs> I, I guess is that asking the question if should we have a team wide password manager? Uh, for example, we can have, a, can have a revocation process ready for uh, such event. So that will not be shared in a GitHub repository, but uh, I'm not uh, the best person to, to make it that plan. Well, I think it's, uh, this is sounding like something we really need to talk about, but uh, we don't really have answers for right now. So I'm thinking let's schedule this conversation for possibly our next meeting in a week and a half. And uh, people who have strong opinions on this or more ideas of how to do revocation and do things like this, they should probably uh, think about it a bit and then we can debate it a bit more clearly and with more background. I mean, the idea seems sensible as something to look more into anyway. So does it sound okay? Zas, Ivan, anyone else? Okay, let's do that. Uh, let me check uh, what else do we have? Okay, since uh, da -da -da. We, we have, you said you have a bit of an hour, Rob? Okay, so, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. let's see what is here that might fit the, uh, we since we're already on disaster method, mechanisms, should we talk about recovering product at a disaster? Or is this too deep for right now? Because, I mean, basically everything we have is code right now anyway except for localization workshop, which probably shouldn't be last thing in the evening because like it's better to do it probably in the middle of the day when everyone is around and everyone is more or less fresh. How about the new contributors topic? Yeah, that, that might work. Okay, we can do that. So making contribution easier for new contributors. That kind of actually, if I understand correctly, that actually kind of joins into the whole thing we're already discussing to some degree, because a lot of that is going to be documentation. So why not? Let's start that. Akshat, this is under you. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, yeah, so like, uh, as you all know, like I've been contributing for like a few months now. And uh, when I first started joining in, uh, it was a bit hard for me to understand how to go about things. Like uh, I jumped into the Android app uh, at the beginning and there was not much documentation and not much about music brains over there. It's just that I had to do a Google uh, search and go to the project, find out about it, go through the wikis and stuff like that. So the pathway was a bit more, bit more than usual uh, because uh, you had to search and you had to have the willingness for it. I don't think like most of the developers would have that who are new, like who are coming in new. So if we want to open a good developer who is not like uh, a fanatic of music as well. So for them, we need to have a better documentation on GitHub as well. So uh, as I see that we make tickets on Jira. So uh, I, I, I'm, I'm of the opinion that we don't uh, add the issues on GitHub, but uh, the developers would uh, prefer the uh, development related issues to be posted more on GitHub as well, right? So I would want to know more that how we could improve that. And do we only want to stick with Jira? Like I understand the bigger concept that Jira is very uh, accessible for everyone who is not a developer as well. So I would suggest that if you can add more beginner friendly issues, uh, like I did, I did see that a few organizations do that. They'll have a few issues open for the beginners. So they will be very like slight changes, but they'll get the uh, developers familiar with the code base. So for that, uh, I was thinking that regarding the GitHub issues and secondly, 
uh, as we were discussing for the last uh, couple of days about uh, making the front end and the back end uh, separations in the uh, project directory so i think alistair can take up on that and uh, yeah i would love to hear everyone's opinion on that okay uh, we can start with ivan you're not audible yeah um just uh, about jira there are some improvements that, that can be made to to make the information more public so if i get it uh, correctly you need to be logged in to to access the information on jira which is not a problem if you have a uh, music brands or listening brands account because there is a uh, auto login from uh, music brands but uh I think it, there was a time where there was spam, and that was the reason it, it has been off to the public. So now we can probably make it public again, and that can help with uh, finding uh, things at least. Uh, Alastair? Um, specifically to, to the two comments, two comments that you made. Um, one of uh, how to give how to present new tasks to to new new people coming in who who might want something to do. We have a label in Jira which is good first task. I think um, we use that as um, the proposed tickets that we that we give to new summer code students. So so to say that that is already there. Um, and and that functionality does exist in um, uh, in the Jira stuff that we have uh, from a from a sort of big big picture point of view. Um, I think we probably do not want to have both GitHub and Jira. Um, so so. Uh, Mess again, perhaps this is a sort of the difference between, you know, new people, old people, like a lot of people expect GitHub, you'll have issues in GitHub. Um, we have had a Jira uh, server in some way, shape or another uh, for what, 15 years or something. So there's sort of a, a big, a big history behind it. And we've been using it for a long time. Um, I'm not saying anything either way about we should keep it or we should move, but you know th there are there are reasons behind uh, uh, behind that. Um, Jira, Jira, Jira. Jira. Yeah. Oh, ri ri written in both ways so that we can yeah, read at least one of them. Yeah. <laughs> very very good. Very good. Uh, I, I think um, I agree with the sentiment. Um, uh, yes, in general, like people slag on Jira a lot and it's terrible in lots of ways, but yeah, I guess it works in lots of ways as well. Um, uh, to, to just, sorry, um, maybe just to put that side to the side and then if other people want to talk about Jira as well. Um, your other comment about, um, on right now, I, I wanted to just, just make an aside. Um, so really interesting to see that you, think that there are improvements to be made. Um, and as we mentioned previously, you are the right person to raise these issues because you're a new contributor coming into the into the community. Um, so your feedback on that is really, really useful and uh, tickets would be appreciated for that. Um, Rob has a nice story that he likes to tell about how incredibly easy the MetaBrains projects are to start up as a developer when you compare them to other projects that exist out there. Um, so to set up Listen Brains, um, regardless of what your what your role is and what, what you understand, you you download the repository and you run the deploy script and it sets up everything and you have a running server. Um, so I, I understand where you're coming from in terms of um, saying, well, maybe people who are interested in only doing front-end development don't necessarily want to set up an entire server and an entire database. Um, I agree there are ways that we can, uh, that we can improve that. Um, but uh, I, I would also point out that 
in the grand scheme of things, I think Rob's right when he says we have a very, very, very easy way of, of setting stuff up uh, compared, to, compared to some other projects. Ima? Maybe Kartik uh, can go first. Sure. Uh, I just wanted to to be Google coding. So like new people to get introduced to the project and also get the help easily to it. But since now coding is no longer there, so yeah, we should make our projects easier so that anyone who sees the GitHub repo or maybe comes into IRC, they can still uh, be interested in the project because uh, uh, if you are not, uh, many people will just start uh, poking the 10 or 15 open source projects once and then see which one is the easiest to get started with and start with it. So we do have some work to do, uh, but yeah, uh, it's not that difficult. But it's important that we uh, make it easier for newer contributors to join. Eva. Uh, so a few things, uh, just uh, having either GitHub or Jira, but not, not both is probably uh, the thing we, we agreed on. So like you said, you don't want to have a search to find it in different tools. So we have Jira from the past, it's just there, not uh, necessarily the, the best choice for everyone, but uh, the one we, we stick to at least, to have at one, one source for tracking issues. And uh, there will be a uh, migration uh, in the two next year from our uh, Jira server to uh, Jira cloud. So maybe there will be a need for uh, for teamwork to, to update things, we see. And the first thing I wanted to mention is we have uh, automation for updating tickets in Jira from uh, GitHub pull request. Uh, there is a bit of documentation on GitHub about that. Uh, you can see dot GitHub in a repository in MetaBrains organization. And maybe we can go further and have uh, something to create tickets in Jira from uh, issues in GitHub or, or documenting uh, how to create issues in Jira from GitHub. I don't know, but if you... If you create a ticket about that and, and uh, ping me specifically, we can uh, work on improving this, this point specifically, how to help uh, developers on GitHub to find issue tracker and how to document and uh, search in issues. Uh, so I had a few comments about the, the whole, but basically, so, Two things, I, two main topics. One is uh, the whole issue with the good beginner code, good beginner ticket. In my experience, uh, there is a problem with that. That means that you set something as a good beginner ticket and that somehow puts it in the drawer of, we don't care about this enough to fix it unless a beginner comes to do it. And I don't think that's necessarily the right approach. So I can see having a, a link to a category good beginner ticket. And that, you know, anytime you are doing tree aging and you see a ticket that would fit there, you mark it. But not necessarily like postpone working on it just because of that. Because we've had those. I mean, I've seen a fair amount of times where we had something set up for GCI. And that meant that something that would have been a really easy fix would actually would actually wait for half a year just to see if someone from GCI would do it. And I don't think that's user friendly. I think that's kind of disrespecting our users' needs in that way. So I really would like to avoid that. Uh, another situation with uh, Jira versus uh, GitHub. Uh, the Music Brains project has several files, which is probably not clear enough. We maybe should make it more clear uh, from the readme. But uh, for example, we specifically have a hacking MD file which specifically documents, you know, you don't want to get set it up, but you want to actually try to do some programming. 
so these, these are some like introductory things like this is a bit of how we do things uh, how would we make uh, connections between Perl and, and the JavaScript layer here's a bit of how like we do some little bits of uh, style of coding style you know a lot of like small things that as a new uh, a new programmer to the project should know I am not sure how many of our projects currently have something like that. I'm assuming it's less than they should. So that would be something to look into. Um, and, so uh, so uh, both Listen Brains and Critique Brains have developer specific documentation on Read the Docs. Um, so so yeah, I mean it's not Packing MD, but it's it's a location where developer specific documentation lives. Sure. Um, I mean, but, I, just but, want, I just I just want to know to make sure that there's at least one very basic here's how to start playing with things page in addition to all of the other documentation because i think especially as, as Karthik and the action mentioned it's really important that you give new developers something to play with a little bit so that once they get interested in that they can go and read the whole docs about whatever they really want to continue doing yeah one thing what Rio was saying regarding the first time issues and uh, the backlog uh, falling in because of that, what we can do is we can make pseudo first issues. So like these are some issues that we have already solved, but uh, they'll be on a separate branch and people can just log into that and uh, like uh, contribute to that. Like that can be an introduction to them. So th those can be like pseudo like issues that could work. Uh, I don't have any firm opinion about this as of now, but uh, we could do that. And uh, 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 regarding the code base thing, like uh, the front end and the back end thing. I think like, uh, as I was saying about, uh, picking a project, like when we were talking about even uh, SSR, so like we should pick a project and firm it out that, you know, it should follow the pattern of maybe that, uh, front end back end code thing, and it should be following all the best practices. So, uh, I think the team should focus on one of the projects very seriously and uh, make sure that it is properly documented as well. And the things are, uh, like properly structured and maybe then we could shift on to the other projects as well. And, uh, I do have some opinions regarding the documentation in the PR review policy. So we'll take on that afterwards. So yeah, regarding the first time issues, like I think on GitHub also, we should have one or two issues or like one or two, like beginning setups, and then we can move them over to Jira. So like Jira is our main setup, but like, uh, on GitHub as well, because when I was starting out, I was just exploring GitHub. So I, I do have a lot of friends who are just doing that. So going to Jira, maybe like we have to make it very clear in the readme read that, you know, you have to move over there, over there and then try to look out for things because understanding Jira also for a first timer, it's a, it's a big, it's a bit of a thing, but, uh, for GitHub, you can just go to the issues and find out the things. So I'm just saying only for beginners only from a beginner perspective. So I just would comment a bit quickly that I think it makes a lot of sense to, at the very least, especially if a project is already using something like good first pack, uh, there should definitely be a link to the good first pack category in Jira for that project as part of the beginner documentation. Because I mean, normally they will get a list and they can see specifically the issues we think that would are good first pack and that should even if we didn't have anything in GitHub, that itself should limit the amount of worry that they have. Uh, Karthik wanted to speak, though, so I'm going to let him. Yeah. My, um, so I also I was also thinking that we could have a sort of a ideal pull request, like say uh, in Listen Brains we recently added stuff so that uh, new music services could be integrated easily. So uh, one of the one of the pull requests was to uh, integrate Spotify, uh, rewriting the Spotify integration, and another pull request was to integrate YouTube. So now, if someone wants to come and implement, say, an iTunes integration or Deezer integration, uh, most of the work is just repeating what has already been done, done there. So, like, uh, if um, um, if we have some sort of uh, some like this pull request, we should uh, make a list of them and put it somewhere so that if someone is interested in tinkering with those parts, uh, they can see uh, how it was done before. Uh, it had, the pull request is already reviewed, so they can also see what issues uh, were the, the previous 
work, uh, person who coded it paste and so on i mean like you uh, see uh, listen brains has all, almost 1600 to 1700 uh, pull requests so it would be difficult to find it but if we uh, but if like we have a ticket to implement a decent integration we should probably put in the pull request link there uh, like this sort of thing Any comments on this? So do, does everyone feel that we have a general idea of what the situation is and and we can like continue talking maybe if we need to talk more, we can talk it tomorrow or even in the next developer meeting. Like we can take a look. I think I would suggest every project the team could take a quick look at what's the state of beginner documentation for developers in your repos and take a, I mean, because you are going to have to do that anyway, when we are having the documentation week, so you might as well do it soonish. So in the next week or two, you take a quick look at the, what the situation is for beginner de documentation for coders, and then we can have a set of ideas of, you know, we can compare, see what seems to be good in one project or another and how we can use the best options for all projects. Does this sound sensible to people? Alex? Um, sort of slight, well, I, related, related to this, I, I'm just looking through some of the Listen Brains good first bugs. Um, I remember maybe last year, maybe the year before, I went through Listen Brains and Acoustic Brains good first bugs and Perhaps, perhaps um, one thing uh, many many of many of our tickets are brain dumps for continuations of things that we've discussed in IRC, let's say. Um, and even though we have a bunch of good first bugs for listen brains, as a newcomer, absolutely no idea no no context about where where to get in and and make a start so, so um, basically every ticket needs to be fashionable on its right. own um i did a bunch of this during uh i, I mean in the pre-summer of code work for i'm not sure if it was last year or this year or the year before um where where i went through and i i actually added in some really specific documentation some really specific comments in the in the ticket and said Hey, to do this, we need to add a new function to this file that checks blah and does X and Y and Z and 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 whatever. Um, sort of following on the discussion about making it making us welcoming to, to potential new people and giving them a place where they know that they can make a start. Um, perhaps this is something to to keep in mind as well when when writing tickets. So instead of just saying um, do X, actually uh, fill in a little bit more detail, a little bit more context. Uh, a reference to that, I, this is why I think it's a good idea to, if you can also, in addition to doing that, linking to the actual ERC uh, conversation using the Brainspot logs, that can also yeah. help. Yeah, there's a fair amount of cases where I've seen that it's as discussed on IRC, but there's no link to the actual discussion in IRC. So given we have the chat logs, it would always make sense to have that if possible. If I yeah, also uh, I noticed that sometimes uh, there were newcomers, like uh, Jung, uh, it happened for, for him and for others too, uh, who picked tickets which are actually uh, not correctly worded or get obsolete. And uh, so they, they implement it correctly, but uh, it's not uh, something wanted, actually. <laughs> like uh, we had a Twitter, I think, uh, cleanup for, uh, for Music Brains, and it was actually not the way we wanted to, to do it. 
So I don't have solution, but uh, it, it's just uh, the same issue you mentioned, Reo and uh, Alastair, about uh, tickets not being uh, correctly uh, accessible to newcomers in general, I think. That is certainly a situation that we've had a few times, yeah, like, and I'm not sure what's a great way to deal with that. That's already starting to be a separate topic, but uh, but I think that uh, this is a topic we really need to think about as well. Like, uh, I think I might make a, a new topic in the, in the summit and we can talk about, or actually, I don't know, we have uh, half an hour now. Maybe we should talk about it, about uh, actually triaging and deciding how to mark tickets that, that shouldn't really be open as not open. I don't, I don't think that's only a problem in music brain, but I don't know how other projects feel about it. Uh, have you had situations, because that's what Ivan is describing, where a user, a, a, a beginner developer, and sometimes not even a beginner, like we'll see a ticket that maybe has been added five years ago, and it's like, well, I can do that. But there is no idea whether you should do that, because no one has actually seen that ticket before and checked no one from the team at least has seen the ticket and said like, you know, yeah, that sounds like something we should work on. And that sounds like something that uh, should be left there as a beginner. You know, it's not marked in any way that maybe we don't actually agree with what is being asked. We, we spent quite a bunch, quite a bit of time over the last five years or so trying to make, um, the getting started summer of code page on the wiki uh, cover a lot of these things and discuss things like um, hey come into the IRC channel and talk to us about something or um, you know if you're interested in picking up a ticket write a comment on the ticket saying hey I'm interested in working on this ticket um, I'm going to do it like this 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 what do you think and wait for feedback from from the developers uh, it just came to mind that the only place this documentation exists is on the Summer of Code Getting Started page. And maybe that should be in the README or a general, you know, how to contribute to MetaBrains projects uh, wiki page instead. Yeah, so that certainly sounds like something that should be, I mean, like, we have a how to contribute page or I'm for music brains at least. I'm not sure if we have a meta brains wide thing we probably don't right now but i'm not honestly sure but uh, we really should have that yeah especially in anywhere where we're gonna have a beginners programmer kind of introduction guide we really should have that but in my experience it's not even necessarily only a beginner's problem i mean i have i have hit that where it's like you know i implement something someone asked for and then the team is like wait i'm not sure this is a good idea and uh, I think I've seen that happen also with other team members where they've introduced, uh, implemented something and then they have been like, yeah, actually really should have talked about this first. I'm not sure if we should have some sort of like specific amount of triaging done or whether it's too much to ask for that. And we should just always basically whatever we pick a ticket to work on, just bring it up with the respective teams or how people feel like, I mean, I mean I'm not sure if it makes sense to have a, Meta brains wide approach to this because some projects are a lot bigger than others, right? But like just kind of wondering in general what people feel about this like, this general issue. I do have another point uh, regarding bringing in new contributors. So I was wondering that do we only want to stay like? Uh, as a part of the internet where people have to explore us or do we do we want to take efforts from our side as well to bring in more people because currently it's just that anyone who finds music brains or finds meta brains or if they interacted with in some way we just have to like we are depending on our luck that our project is out there and it's very accessible only then the uh, if the de developers are uh, interested or like uh, are familiar with the project only then they are uh, planning to join us so do we want to stick with that or do we want to make some external efforts to bring in more people Rob. Yeah. 
probably muted yourself instead of unmuting yourself. Um, so in the past, uh, we tried to actually reach out and uh, bring some people into the community. It never really worked very well. Um, what, what really tends to bring people into the community is to, I, I, so the saying I used to have back in the day on to, on to get, get more people doing things is activity begets activity, right? If you're, if you're just online and like, I am doing stuff, I'm actually like, um, do South from last week was sort of the, uh, it was a very good example. It's like, you know what, it's a holiday here in Catalonia. Um, I kind of feel like working, but I kind of feel like doing something fun for a change. So I'm going to go spend part of my day doing this fun thing, right? And actually, Lucifer is like, hey, wait a minute. That sounds like fun. I want to jump into that, right? That principle works. Yeah, which is also the principle by which I've been encouraging us to, you know, whenever we do a release, let's tweet about it. Whenever we do something that's a little bit more long form, let's post it to the forums, let's post it to the blog, let's just be a little bit more noisy about what we're doing, right? We're coming out of this phase, as I kind of described, we're coming out of like this, this, this three to five year phase where Alistair and I bootstrapped two new projects. Right, and bootstrapping a project, especially in our world, means you have to wait for this thing to actually come of age before it becomes useful. Right, we're now at a point where these are useful, and we're picking new features out and we're talking about them. And I am seeing that there's more of an uptick of more people coming in. Uh, in particular, uh, Rick Sucks, who seems to have dropped off now, but um, uh, and also Tandy uh, and some of the funk whale people that have been appearing are basically coming because of this sort of result, right? So an active effort for like drawing people out and saying, hey, would you come hack over here? I find it very difficult. And it's the same thing for, for when one of our board members says like, hey, these people over there, I think they're using your data, you should go knock on their door. I, you don't know which door to knock on. That's really difficult. That seems like a waste of my time, right? But oftentimes it works best is when, when, when we're just making sure that the door is wide open. When somebody walks into this door, we say like, hey, welcome. Hey, how can we help you? And we've been doing a really good job of that when we met our brains together, right? So as people are coming in and, uh, you know, and as we're dealing with and talking about things and so forth, we should continue to make sure that people are welcome. We should continue to point them towards things. And when they ask a question, like Akshay is doing, hey, um, let's make a note of that. That's a bug documentation problem. We'll go address that in January, right? I think that is, is a lot better than trying specifically to go out to people and draw people into the community. And like I said, I think we're already on the right track for, for bringing in, I mean, Listen Brains, I think is now, you know, and you know, all of the things that we've been doing with Listen Brains are a whole bunch of features designed to make all of our projects much more rounded, much more uh, broadly interesting for people. Right, and these people that are going to be coming in are going to be invigorating us, bringing us data editors and so forth. So my answer to this is blog, tweet, talk, chat, what have you, right? And in fact, I would welcome everybody, and this is offered to everybody. If you're doing a release of anything, right? Would you, you don't feel like tweeting? That's cool. I don't mind tweeting. Like writing 130 characters of stuff and just you're know, shooting it out there or something and I don't have to think about it. So do me a favor. Um, if you're doing a release and you don't feel like tweeting, say, hey, Rob, I'm doing this release. Here's the link to the release. Go write a tweet and get it out there. Those things help a lot. Okay, I'm going to make a quick comment and then pass it to Kirk. So I just want to say that that's effectively how I started programming for Music Brains, and I am actually in the team now. So, and I think that's true of also Michael and Ivan that we were both, okay. both of us were using music brains. That's a I mean, we were all using music brains. Like, uh, I think that's, uh, I mean, any, every, I think, well, I guess Michael came from Jitsi, okay? I forget if he was already doing stuff in music brains before, but I think a lot of the things we're seeing is that people come to music brains to use music brains, then they are annoyed by something, then they are like, I want to fix this thing. And uh, I think that, uh, I mean, that worked for me. I think it worked for a lot of other people. In the same way, we get users coming to Music Brains because Last FM used to tell them, your attacks are shit, go fix them. We actually get people getting into Music Brains, user script writing, or even into actual PRs because 
they are like your code is shit, I'll fix it. So I think that that uh, that is working, and I'm not sure if we can improve it further by actually promoting in the right places. But I think yeah, like uh, it would need to be very specifically looking into the right places, and we would have to figure out very specifically what the right places are where we have the specific people who are into these kinds of things, and then maybe promoting. Anyway, Karthik. So regarding tweeting on a release, we can implement a GitHub action or a bot for that. Like uh, the, the release notes are currently auto-generated. Um, if we make our PR titles enough informational or if we are willing to edit the release notes, uh, we can have it that uh, whenever the release is published, the, re the release notes get turned into a tweet or something. That's customizable, but uh, and a thing to explore because that saves us from logging into Twitter and loads the barrier for making a tweet. That's one thing you can explore. Uh, and another thing is like, oh, we discussed uh, promoting the blog last year, but I don't think we did many efforts uh, after that. So definitely we should pick up on that again and try to promote the blog more. Yeah, it's one of those things where there isn't a clear solution and the problems are not so dire. And there's a lot of things that we're picking up saying we should go do this. Let's let's not pick up another one for now. It's not that drastic. Uh, one thing that I just noticed on IRC where Bob was mentioning we need to find a way for team members to get more involved on requests everywhere in the process to make sure that the specs are clear. So I think just through in two levels, and I've seen problems with both. One is that uh, it's very hard to react to every new ticket that comes in and make sure this is actionable and reasonable. But it's something we, I think all teams, at least Music Brains team, and I'm trying to do that, but it's not always easy. But I think all teams probably should try to keep an eye on. Like, you know, whenever you get a ticket by someone who is not in the core team, and possibly even if they are, but especially if not, does this look sensible? Does this look actionable? And do we actually agree this makes sense? So at least if no one, if nothing else, at least one member of the team has made sure that they don't think it's a problem if someone does come and implement it. Another problem that I've seen is that literally no one, me included, uses the in-progress button or very often people will only assign tickets to themselves in the last moment after they've already written all the code or situations like that. And I mean, I'm, I'm guilty of that myself. And I don't think I'm the only one. So a situation, and, I, and sometimes the situations, not so much now, but I've seen a couple of times where it's like, oh, so I implemented like, a, and I like half of the implementation of this. And then I asked a question on IRC and then I got a message from like Michael or whatever, like, oh, I actually have an almost working implementation of that. I just need to put it up. And uh, I mean, that's bad enough uh, if it happens with, with the team, right? But you know, it's like, well, I wasted an hour. I, I don't mind that much, but if that's, for example, the first PR by a beginner editor, and then it's like, yeah, actually we already have code for that. Sorry for wasting your time. I expect this editor is not coming back. So this is also something we probably need to think about to also be very specific and uh, very taking a lot of care and actually marking ourselves as doing things if we are doing things. I think that would avoid situations where the beginners get really annoyed by stuff. Uh, Katka. Yeah, um, tickets do have a start process ability. So um, we should maybe tell everyone that if, you, if you're starting on a ticket, say so, put, put that it's in process. Yeah, it, it, I think different kinds of tickets have process progress or like different ways of saying it, but the effect is the same. Yeah, like, you know, even if you in the end stop doing it, at least if I take it over, I will know to go ask you like, hey, so how much did you get done here? Do you have any code that may be useful to me, et cetera? So I think that this is something that we really should be trying to do more. I mean, I don't know how other projects do. Maybe like Listen Brains does great on this already. I know Music Brains does not. I know instrument, instruments have it at least. Fresso wants to say something? Yeah, Alastair certainly does. 
<laughs> that 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 comment sounded ominous. Of course, Alistair has something to say. Well, um, you have a hand raised, Professor Dustin. So. Um, question to the music brains people: How frequently do you work on something that does not have a ticket? Uh, for front end stuff, or like well, user facing stuff, fairly rarely. Uh, basically, I think most of us tend to create a ticket and then start working on it, if only because most of our PRs are named after the ticket. So, you know, like, it, it, which I think is actually a really good thing to try to do because that basically makes it so that it's really annoying to work otherwise, because if you don't have a ticket, you cannot open a branch. And if you cannot open a branch, then you're just basically, I mean, you can try a few things on master or whatever, but eventually if you want to save something, at least if you have any work done, you're going to need a ticket. The only situation where I've seen this not really happen is when we are doing specific things that are refactoring only, for example, then I will sometimes, and I think I'm not the only one who will not create a ticket, will just be like, you know, S-Lint fixes and then just do some S-Lint fixes and things like that. I mean, I don't know, Ivan and Michael might want to comment on this. Um, some, sometimes we also split uh tickets into several tickets if we realize that we are making more changes to the other than we expected to so we do a lot of changes without tickets but it's always uh, uh, something that won't uh, impact uh, the user at all or it's a uh, very small refactoring not something large but uh, mo most of them we create additional tickets uh, after having uh, coded uh, the, the change but before yeah, that that's true that we have sometimes had situations where either we make a uh, refactoring that eventually we decide you know this should be in the blog post and for the blog post we need a ticket because we take the release issues from jira directly and as such we actually create a ticket just before the blog post that's rare but it has happened and more often, it's the kind of situation where you're working on one bug or one feature, and then you find another bug of feature. So eventually, at first, like uh, possibly you have it in the same PR and uh, the same commit, and eventually you're like, you know, those are actually separate enough. I'm gonna create a separate ticket and move it to a different commit in the same PR and like, you know, separate it more properly. Those are the usual cases where we usually start work and then create the ticket. It's not very common, but it does happen. Um. I, I don't want to try and open a, a can of worms uh, ten minutes before the end of the um, end of today's session. But but you're gonna do it anyway. Of course. I mean, I'm, I'll I'll mention it, and then if if anyone wants to continue discussing, then then they can. Um, would would say that that Listen Brains does this very poorly. Um, even you know, in comparison to music brains, that that is, there there are a lot of pull requests which are, oh, we discuss something in IRC. Um, I'm I'm sorry sorry to call you out directly, uh, Rob, um, but you do lots of um, PRs that say as it says on the tin, um, which loses a lot of context. I mean, I mean, this this is going into a sort of a longer a longer discussion, sure, um, but you know, we'll have a big discussion on IRC. And then we'll do something, a, a pull request that says, as it says on the tin. And then a year later, we decide, you know, why was this decision made? And there's not a lot of context as to why that was made and why we decided to do it. Um, and so having tickets and having tickets and commit messages so that we can go back and, and see why. Um, I opened a ticket a few months ago when we were talking about what were we talking about? We're talking about importing uh, listens from Spotify for local files. And we decided to not do it. And so I opened a ticket and wrote the decision and closed the ticket so that we at least had a decision so that we could say, you know, if, if in the future we go back to it and decide, hey, why do we do this? We, there's actually a record of it in Jira. Um, and so I'm, I'm not saying that I know a solution to this or, and, and I certainly don't want to put an iron fist down and say every single task that we work on must have a fully specified JIRA ticket because I know that none of us want to do that. Um, but 
maybe there's a middle ground and but this also ties into new user document you know new developer documentation and things like that as well I'll... so two suggestions uh, about that one thing that they found really works for us to make sure we document things in tickets is uh, our release process and documentation in in the blog i think it was ivan that set a template Anyway, do we have a template on the blog, which is basically just like, which is also the reason why we always post when we're releasing because half of it is already written. So it's a lot easier. And uh, basically we will usually will combine the template we have with the list of uh, tickets in the specific Jira release we are releasing with, you have a button to just get the list in a very nice and comfortable way. And just by having the combination of two things, it makes it a lot more a lot less painful to actually write blogs about the releases, which I think is really useful. Plus, it makes it a lot less painful to actually document the stuff that you are releasing. And uh, about this as well, one thing I want to comment is don't assume tickets are enough. Tickets are great, but I mean, I used to assume tickets are enough. And then I started looking at our old code, and there's a lot of tickets by, you know, Holly or whatever back in the day where the entire uh, message, commit message is something like as discussed in bugs.musicbrains.org slash whatever, which is gone. And as far as I understand, we don't have a backup for. So, you know, effectively that's the same as telling as discussed on IRC. Like really I have nothing to do to find out why this was done. And sometimes some things, some things look a bit stupid and it's like, wait, why did it happen? Okay, no idea, fine. I'm gonna remove it and see what happens. And ideally you would avoid a situation where you're gonna do, I'm gonna remove it and see what happens. So like if, if uh, and I mean, that's something Ivan has been insisting on. And I think that's a really good point. Like always the commit message should always, even if it kind of duplicates the ticket, always actually say, like do triplicate even what we try to do is basically triplicate like commit message should have information the ticket should have information and the pull request should have information and very often that's the same right like the pull request is the commit message and the commit message will have stuff copied from the ticket so it's actually a lot less work than it sounds like if the ticket itself is good but like it actually really makes it easier later where I open yeah, something that Michael did two years ago and I'm like, oh, so that's why he did it. And then I, if I have a link to the ticket, it's also, oh, and that's what the ticket said. And that's the conversation that was on IRC that is also linked from the ticket. And, you know, it works. Otherwise, the older stuff just doesn't work at all. And it's just like guessing. It's completely guessing. I think uh, I think actually uh, uh, commit messages in PR. You are not Ivan. Raise Sorry. your hand. But okay, Ivan, go. Continue. Anyway, yeah. I just just wanted continue. to say I think it's the more perennial, uh, the more perennial of them all is uh, is going to be uh, anything that's uh, uh, Git related because uh, it's part of the entirety of the of the code base. Whereas, as you said, all the other all the other options, even Jira in the future, could just disappear. Uh, whereas the commit message won't. Ivan. Um, uh, okay. Well, we, we worked on uh, on that on uh, improving uh, commit message and ticketing it all. But uh, I, I wanted to say I'm not uh, shocked that it was not a process like that in listen brains. It depends on the age of the project. If something uh, you start from scratch. It's uh, expected you you're you're not uh, digging I into uh, paperwork, uh, getting uh, busy with paperwork. I would say, and we do the same when, when we have a fresh new uh, set of features like uh, uh, co collection collaborators, for example. We had a lot of, of features which were not necessarily documented, uh, so. The, in music ones, uh, we usually do a lot of ticketing, but not all, all the time. And it's uh, expected that uh, listen brands when, when it was a lab, and, and uh, I think they are, they are still 
uh, new fields of uh, new features coming up, which will uh, not have to follow uh, a strict process of documenting uh, just it just experiments. So, <laughs> so just uh, advocating the David <laughs> after advocating uh, tickets. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I mean, that's true that uh, sometimes it might be like, I mean, especially for some very small things or if it's like, that. yeah, I mean, like, for example, what Ivan mentioned about collection collaborator, I mean, the tickets are there, but the documentation, for example, is pretty much not there at all. And uh, for example, the tests were also not there at all. The tests they added like two weeks ago, and that was like, what, almost a, a year? even more than a year after we added the feature. So, I mean, yes, we are not always great with it, but I do think that it's a good thing to be aiming towards. And I mean, if it doesn't always happen, that's fine, but it really, really helps for a lot of things. Yes. Uh, Alistair, did you bring this up specifically just to shit on Rob or did you, or, or like, was it a more general, I mean, okay. Did you mean to bring it up only for a listen brace, or was it a more general situation? Well, I mean, that's that sort of why watch? why I asked about music brains because I, I mean, very very broadly, I I would say I think we could probably do it better in listen brains. And yes, there was the one example um, about about Rob, but I'm sure we all make sort of similar issues as well, some similar mistakes. Um, and so I I guess sort of based on, well, yeah, what did Lucifer say? Oh no, tests and other can of worms, no. I mean, yeah, opening up a can of worms about how to manage tickets and documentation and commit history and, and whatever. And I, I did apologize for sort of opening up a new uh, train of discussion right at the end of the, end of the day. But um, yeah, I just wanted to get some feedback and opinions. So one thing I, I have feedback for listen brains, I think that uh, I get inundated sometimes by listen brains emails with from Jira, which I assume mean you have a release. But are you from, from Jira or from GitHub? From here, I think. From items being closed or whatever. I'm subscribed to that. Um, but that that's mostly Lucifer going through and looking at Jira and realizing that. 17,000 things have been fixed since the last time he did this okay. and just going through and closing them. Well, that, um, that's actually a really good point of why tickets should be linked to PRs because then you don't have to yeah. do that. In fact, yeah, uh, we have yeah, we have lit, in Music Brains at least, I don't know if you have it set it up too, but if not, you probably should. We yeah, we, we do. Set up the, yeah, so it closes the tickets on its own anyway when you have them on the PR. So like it saves a lot of time for that. But I mean, in general, like when whenever you're releasing a new set of features to listen to listen brains, has that been documented anywhere, like in the blog or anywhere? We so we have a release on GitHub which lists the pull requests, and if the pull request had a ticket number in the title, then it has the ticket as well. Um, but the majority of our pull requests don't have tickets. So I would really suggest to document what you're releasing. I mean, I think that works really well for music brains at least. That you, if you're putting a basic blog post, which is like, because not everyone is gonna go to, to GitHub and check the releases, that's more a developer kind of thing, but especially if you're releasing anything that's user facing, just put a blog so, post. So, so for example, Rob is doing that more often now. I mean, even, his, I mean, his comment about not necessarily liking Twitter, um, but we do now, I mean, in, in the last few months, we've regularly tweeted and said, hey, we've got a new feature, um, and we link to the release on GitHub, which which then, I mean, and it lists in much the same way that a, that a Music Brains blog post sure. lists all I mean, the like, tasks. What, do your Listen Brains releases on GitHub have like an introduction in normal speech as well? That's a thing I would suggest you do. That's the one thing we don't, we have in the Music Brains blog post that I think most GitHub releases don't, which is just one paragraph or so. Like, you know, as a user, the most interesting parts of this are this. Like, usually it will be like, if it's only small bug fixes, it will just be like, you know, we fixed a bunch of small bugs, just check the list behind, below. But if we have an actual feature, for example, we will be like, and like here, 
you might like the biggest features here are this and this and maybe a couple sentences about each of them and then I, we expect yeah. people we just go play with this stuff this is this is what i do in the twitter posts i pick the the things that are really most useful uh user facing features and highlight those um and, and i should also really say that uh you know sometimes in a week you can have two or three listen breaks releases because we make the process so easy and uh, so it's very fast to make a release and you know, at what point do you do a blog post for that, right? Because like blog posts sure for like, oh yeah, we hot fixed this one thing because we cocked up that little thing. Doesn't necessarily make sense, but uh, yeah, I, I don't know when the right time is to go, you know, make a generalized blog post that summarizes everything we're doing. Sure, I mean, I guess the difference with that is that we have a very specific schedule now, right? So it's a lot easier for us in that sense. Like we release every two weeks if everything goes right, three weeks or whatever if there's a problem. But basically, so we, those are the main releases and those we put blog posts about and whatever, but any hot fixes and whatever, we usually don't put blog posts about. At most, we edit the existing blog post a little and say like, so we hot fixed this. So like, that's usually how we've done it, but that might not make sense for, for the way you're doing it in Listen Brains right now. But I mean, if you're already putting at least on Twitter, the most useful things about the release, you might as well also copy that to the release itself on GitHub and then it's there. Sounds better than nothing. Anyway, uh, I think uh, Kartik was first and then Monkey. Uh, so uh, I think we could do like a monthly roundup uh, at the end of the month or maybe two months, whatever feels right. Uh, list all the major features we released and put out a blog post for that. Uh, that seems mostly... sensible. Yeah, most uh, like uh, as Rob said, uh, we already put out the tweets. So maybe just copy the text from there and consolidate in the one uh, one blog post at the end of the month. Something I would like recommend that. running the blog post by Presso or me or like anyone who's not directly involved in the Listen Brains team. And with that, yeah, we can actually, sense. you know, then we can take a quick look. Just do we understand what's going on here? And if not, we can tell you. Uh, Monkey then Rob, or, is, or does Rob really want to talk now? Uh, I think my, my point is uh, uh, on point here because uh, Fresa does post the uh, weekly team meeting minutes. Um, would it make sense to to basically have like a recap in the MetaBrains world that basically also summarizes what releases we had? Is that an appropriate form? Uh, yeah, I think uh, I think that would be good. But uh, we should definitely send the matter to Fresa. It should not be his job to collect that. So we all should send it uh, to him. That this was done, we did this this week, but it's something notable. Uh, please put it out there. So I mean, how do you feel about that? If people provide stuff that you include in the weekly summary, you do it, but you don't really have any extra work for like chasing people who provide this info? Yeah, so what the, the primary reason- How about I'm... a monthly summary instead? The primary reason I stopped doing the monthly Metabrain things was because it required me to chase down everything and required me to look up everything. And I asked the people to like, hey, if you see something, or if you know of something, can you please send it to me? And I got nothing. And it was just, it, it just became too much work to, to kind of do all the research required for, for those monthly ones. But on that note, if people are actually reaching out to me and telling me, hey, this is a great piece of thing and we release this feature in, in listen brains can you can you uh, can you add this to the weekly or monthly uh, recap thing that is going to be a lot more manageable for me because it requires me to do a lot less of the investigative reporting uh, part of of it so so absolutely uh, monkey then Ivan and we should probably start thinking of finishing the topic and uh, finishing for the day yeah uh i mean i really like the idea of a monthly meta brains uh, this is what happened this month but uh i think if we end up in the same situation where we all think it's a great idea but you end up having to do all the work because we forget that we're doing it uh might not be a solution in which case uh, I, I guess we just volley it back to uh, to each uh, separate project team uh, to to have them do their own monthly post uh, separately 
so that uh, you know if if we if we cock up, it's it's not your it's not because uh, uh, you didn't push us hard enough or or however else, and it's uh, it's because we just we didn't do it. So there's there's none. Yeah, I also don't want um, to like 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 Rob doesn't want to go around and poke people. I also don't want to go around to poke yeah. people and remind them. Uh, and also, I also want to say that more activity is more better so if if we have one post from acoustic brains one post from listen brains one post from from music brains and so on that is better than one post for all of meta brains uh so it yeah. also makes it easier to people for people to follow only what they want by using tags in the blog so if we are able to do this they would prefer that too but it we might not have enough all the time and uh, and from from those separate blog posts, it's also easy then to make a to make a, a quarterly roundup of uh, of the top features because the blog posts are already posted. I think uh, I was uh, I just wanted to add something that the the Listen Brains team we we had started doing uh, uh, kind of like weekly or biweekly uh, going through PRs and uh, and and making sure that we. Uh, uh, merge a bunch of stuff and finish it up. Uh, it usually came with uh, with uh, a new release, and uh, and I think if we continue to do uh, semi regular uh, marathons like this, that's the right time to do uh, to do those uh, those posts uh, on social media and on, on the blog posts and etc. Because uh, we're all, if we're already uh, have a um, a sort of flexible release schedule like that. Um, we should use that energy that we're putting towards finishing up PRs to also uh, quickly write a few words of uh, of those PRs when we when we do a release. Uh, Ivan. Yeah, and also do do feel about the, the monthly report because it. You, you already said it, it will be only one person being in charge of uh, summarizing for everyone, whereas I, I think it should be part of the, the project, uh, just like documentation should not be delegated. Uh, and to add to Mon Monkey's comment about uh, blogging for every project, maybe we should use uh, uh, breaking features for uh, articles. The problem with the blog actually is uh, the, blog, the blog posts are too long, so people uh, won't read, won't go to the next uh, post. They, they will just see currently the speaker 2.7 beta 1. And to find uh, the next post is very far away. So if we generalize having a summary, uh, maybe the blog post will be more attractive. Uh, we did, it for, uh, for we did it for GSOC. We did it for GSOC summaries, but uh, if we can generalize, maybe uh, I am what putting for. <laughs> so I, I think that sounds good. Is this a thing that can be set up automatically, or does the writing person writing the post need to do something it, on their own? They, they need to uh, to insert a specific uh, item in the WordPress editor, maybe I, I can document how okay. to do that. Yeah. Can you very much add it to, can you at least add it to the music Brains template to make sure we're using this? Or, because I don't think it's there right now, right? It's not there right now, no. Yeah, so maybe we can add this to the music Brains templates uh, okay. at first so that the people can get used to it a bit. And then if other teams start using templates, they can add it to their own. Uh, I think that would seem sensible to me. And uh, then you can, you know, if you if anyone sees a very long blog post in the blog, they can remind the per, the yeah. person who wrote it, like, hey, maybe insert a, a break. No, that, that you mentioned that uh, uh, having template for a release blog post is very useful. I, I mean, we use it since uh, one year ago for music brands, something like that, and uh, we spent a lot less of time for releasing. Uh, New versions. Yeah, I, I wouldn't imagine dealing with this in the way we do now otherwise. Like it's it, it's so much of a time saver. I really recommend everyone to do it. And uh, also, 
I really recommend if you don't have a specific document about how to release the project, they, like we have for SysWiki, that specifically tells you update things on Jira, make sure everything looks good, then make a blog post. Here is the template. Then that's also a really useful thing because it removes all the thinking from it. So it actually makes it a lot easier and lot, removes a lot of friction. Uh, anyone else wants to say anything or should we start finishing for the day? Because I see a lot of tired faces. Um, just one comment that I oh, no. haven't been documenting this discussion. So please um, write bullet points or something uh, of everything you can remember into the comment, into the document. Okay. Yeah, so uh, I think we are done for now, unless Alastair has another can of worms to open. Okay, go for it. Okay, don't go for it. Uh, in that case, Rob, back to you. Uh, okay, well, thank you for officiating the, uh, the afternoon, much appreciated. Spreading the load around a little bit, so I'm not just constantly battling, I appreciate that. Um, I think this uh, today was useful. Um, I, I feel towards the end we kind of petered out, but I think we can uh, possibly pick up this topic with a little bit more vigor tomorrow and see if we can come up to a more cohesive conclusion. But for now, um, everyone go get some rest and then we'll meet back together same time tomorrow. Uh, except for Cat Cat, who has something important to say that is fish or ish. Yep. I think I think the idea is probably gonna be if anyone wants to stay here and socialize, the channel is gonna remain open for a while. Oh uh, yes. Yeah, or play something or whatever. So if anyone's really tired, just go to sleep. If anyone wants to try some games or just stay and chat, then we are not closing this yet. So, okay, so you can do that. Right. So close the meeting when things are done. I will be, I, I don't know if I need to stay present. I'll just turn off my video and my audio and disappear. And then hopefully I think we end up with the right now. Okay. okay. Uh, so thanks, everyone. Uh, up for socializing, stick around. Otherwise, we'll see the rest of you tomorrow. Thank I you, everyone. I believe you should be able to leave the meeting and I should become the new host as co host. So maybe you can give it a quick shot. And if not, we can reopen. Or maybe he already closed his computer, in which case, maybe. let it be like it is. Oh, oh yeah, it worked. It yeah, worked yeah, yeah. for the host now. OK, really good. So um, I'm going to suggest a five minute break before socializing, though, because I am it's also never. So not sure whether I can be around for socializing today, because I need to go get some food. I need to go do some stuff. Um, Maybe I'll, but I'll be like, you can ping me on ISC and I will see it if you need me to do any host stuff. Uh, okay. But for right now, I'm going to end the YouTube stream. So YouTube, we'll see you tomorrow. Bye.